Welcome to Headlines. This is Ari Wasserman sitting in for David Lichtenstein. This show is the second of a two-part series about Chosh and Mishpat, or business ethics in the workplace. And today we are going to discuss a book that I have in my hand, Build a Better Life by Stealing Office Supplies. Again, it's called Build a Better Life by Stealing Office Supplies. And I'll give a couple of examples of what it says in the book. It has a section on perks like business lunches, and it says as follows. When using the company's money to pay for a meal, it is expected that you will order the most expensive items on the menu. In the section discussing stealing office supplies, it says as follows. Most companies consider the theft of office supplies and unspoken company benefit. That's how people with your salary can afford nice things. So that's going to be the subject of this show, the things that people typically look at as the small stuff. The prior show was about gray areas, most primarily what can be expense to the company and what has to be a personal expense. I saw KPMG had a report And they recorded some creative interpretations of the term business expenses. One of the examples that an executive attempted to expense to the company unsuccessfully was the entire cost of his daughter's wedding. He listed it as a business development expense because he had invited clients. So our show, we're going to focus on the small stuff. And just by way of example, use of time on the job when somebody's on the clock, taking a personal call, going out to the cleaners, going to a child sitter party. There was recently somebody showed me a Wall Street Journal article called How to Secretly Watch the Office at the Office. Apparently, the office is a show, a popular show, and in there it talks about a certain employee at a company that was cost was caught more than a few times by his bosses watching this show. So what this employee went and did is he hired a development team. He worked with a development team to create an app that would enable him and others to surreptitiously watch shows at one's desk without fear. What he did was he developed this application that it molds that show into the desktop, into the screen, so it looks like it's a proper application that is used for work purposes, but really, he's able to watch the show secretly without getting caught. So that's one of our topics, use of time on the job when we're on the clock, use of office supplies for personal use, using the company assets, the company food. There's an unbelievable story I heard about Rav Yosef Tzvi Dunner when he was the Rush Basting of the Kadassia Basting in London. Rav Dunner was strict to never drink a cup of coffee at the offices of the basin. He was of the view that the coffee was there for those who work full-time. It was for the secretaries, but he was not at the office all day long, only part, so he would not touch the coffee. So there was one occasion that a secretary went out and bought with her personal funds coffee and sugar, brought it and said, Rav Dunner, now you can drink coffee at, at the basin, and Rav Dunner, very appreciative, but said, no, thank you. He would not drink the coffee still because it was prepared with the electricity paid for by the basting office. So our question is, do we really need to be that strict? So in fact, if we look at the halachas, in Shulchan Aruch, Hoshin Mishpat, in Hilchas Geneva and Gezela, it says that it is prohibited to steal Afilu Kol Shuhu, even the smallest amount, Din Torah. It is an Isr Doraisa to steal even small amounts. So apparently, we would have to take Rav Dunner's strictness, and there is not much to discuss on this show. On the other hand, is that the standard we use at work? So before continuing... Just real quickly, how big a problem is this? It's indeed Papermate, the famous pen company, did an anonymous survey before it launched a new pen, and it turned out the results as follows. 100% of office workers admitted to having stolen a pen at work. That is 100%. Before continuing, I just want to go through our riddle for the week.
So the riddle is actually based on a question that we asked on last show, and the question was as follows. If somebody consults or works for two employers, has two bosses, and he goes on a business trip for each of them, for example, he's taking business meetings at a certain location on behalf of both of them, so he has airfare and he has food and he has hotel expenses, is he permitted to expense the full amount of the trip to each of them, or does he have to prorate it? So in that regard, we actually have not one, not two, but three questions for today. Question number one is, where is there a Mishnah that tells us that if somebody has two employers, one individual has two employers, for example, each of them has half of his time, that indeed they would be makbid on each other. And the limud for us from that is in our situation, because they would be strict if they knew about each other, you would not be permitted to expense the full amount to each of them. You'd have to prorate it or work it out some other way. So what's the Mishnah that teaches us that if you have two employers for the same individual, they are makbid on each other. And the next question, a Mishnah that seems to imply otherwise when it comes to our question, if you have two people commit to pay for the same expense, for the same reimbursement, or even three people commit to, say, to pay for the same expense, that we learn from a Mishnah that each one needs to pay the full amount. So that is another Mishnah we're looking for. And number three, how do we reconcile those two Mishnayas in order to answer our question? So we have three questions, not one or two. I'm happy to give out many of Rav Dovin Lechtenstein's books. It's easy for me to do that. So that is our riddle for the week. Now to introduce our guests, we have an unbelievable slate of guests joining us today. Number one, we're going to hear from Rav Ephraim Goldberg, who is a very popular speaker. He is the Rav of a massive shul in Florida, and he is going to speak to us about certain hashkafit aspects of Chush and Mishpat in the workplace. So we're going to go from Hashkaf, and then we're going to move on to Rav Yona Reis to talk about halachic aspects of being in the workplace. Rav Yona Reis is the Av Beistin of the CRC, Chicago Rabbinical Council, and he's going to teach us that there are actually two main standards, maybe not looking, strictly speaking, at the halachas of Gazela Koshu, but maybe something overrides that. What's the Minaga Medina? That's an objective criteria. As what's the local custom, or I like to say industry standard that would prohibit or permit our use of time, assets, office supplies, food, etc. on the job. And even more important than the Mina Medina is the second standard, what's my company's policy when it comes to my specific subjective company policies or even within the company, my boss, that may override Everything, And then we're going to bring on two examples of the importance of company policy. We're going to have two case studies from two senior executives, and we're going to see different extremes, not exactly polar extremes, but very different approaches to what's permitted and not permitted. Avi Steinloff is the CEO of Edmonds, which is a large internet company in Southern California, which has a very flexible and permissive policy when it comes to employee use of time, assets, and company food. So that's going to be case study number one. And case study number two, we're going to hear from Harry Rothenberg, who is a well-known speaker. He's a partner in a New York law firm, which has a much more standard company policy when it comes to vacation and hours and use of assets. And then last, we are going to conclude this show with Judge Rochi Fryer, the famous judge, Hasidic judge in the New York City civil court who will teach us the importance of maintaining who we are, maintaining our values, be it in monetary issues or non-monetary issues when we are on the job. Joining us now is Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, who is the senior rabbi of the Boca Raton Synagogue, which happens to be one of the largest shuls in the United States of America, making it actually one of the largest shuls in the world. He's a prolific author and is consistently an inspiring speaker. I have heard him on a number of occasions, and I have not been let down even once. Rabbi Goldberg, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a great privilege. 
So where do we start? It's a large topic, Hosh and Mishpat in the workplace. I think I'll start with a specific area, a specific question about your shul, and maybe we can globalize the topic. Somebody comes into shul and you know that he's not ethical in business, and that could be a range of simply having insider information about him, or it could be that he's on the front page of the New York Times in some scandal would you give such a person an aliyah? And, and practically speaking, I'd love to hear, have you actually had this issue in your shul? It's a great question, and this is such an important topic. I'm really glad that you're covering it because I don't know that we emphasize this area of Jewish life enough. Um, unfortunately, I have had it, and I would argue probably any rabbi of almost any size shul, if they're in touch with and they're familiar with what's really happening with the members of their shul, probably has confronted this issue. And it's, it's complex because, as you alluded to, there are very diverse scenarios where there's a public scandal or clearly a public violation of law, an indictment, an arrest, someone comes out of prison, versus you as the rabbi have had to mediate or negotiate with um, people who've acted in bad faith. And so you're familiar with what's happening in, inside. And, and there's a lot of variables to concern yourself with. There's the integrity of the shul itself. What kind of shul is willing to give a kibud, which at its root is the word kavod? You're giving an honor to somebody. And, and whom do we honor? Do we honor people who act unethically? Um, there's obviously a whole literature about giving kibudim to people who are not fully shomer Torah or mitzvahs in the sense of Shemir Shabbos. And there should be, and there is an equivalent literature about giving kibudim to people who in the realm of Ben Adam Lachavero violate that space and take advantage of people. So on the one hand, there's the integrity of the shul and, and the statement of who do we honor. On the other hand, there's the individual himself and people's ability to do chuva. Have they sincerely remorsed? Are they remorseful? Have they been repentant? Have they made amends with the people that they hurt? And then, of course, there's the family member of the person who you're denying a kibud. Um, sometimes you hurt them more when you give a kibud. I was having a conversation recently with another young rabbi who was seeking advice in a similar situation of somebody who got out of prison, was coming to shul, seeking a kibud. And I said, you know, if that person receives a kibud, there's the question of the integrity of the shul. There's the question of whether they deserve it. But to me, the biggest question is when they ascend the bima, when they get that kibud or they lead that davening, all anyone in the room who's followed their scandal will be thinking about is where they just came from, what they've done, the people they've hurt, and it's a topic of every Shabbos table conversation. So sometimes the responsible thing to protect the family of such an individual who's so arrogant and egotistical, they don't even care or realize how much will be spoken about them, but their family shouldn't suffer necessarily as a result. So it's a complex area, and I guess the, the best way I could say it to you is it's one we should be concerned with. I think a lot of times Rabbanim have to use their discretion and work with Gabayim to use their common sense and their seichel. Sometimes it's not a matter of a public protest to say so-and-so can't have an aliyah, look at their, their poor business conduct. It's just about the seichel to whisper to Gabayim, if you can, try to avoid their getting a kibud. On the other hand, there's also the other variable of, of sometimes people have chiyuvim. Somebody has a yurt site, somebody's an avelos. And so how do you weigh that? responsibility towards their showing covered hamas for the person that they lost versus their own personal conduct and the, impl and the impact on the greater shul. It's a really complex area. Minimally, we should be engaged in the struggle, thinking about it, and at least making the statement that we care about this as much as we care about other areas of halacha and religious life. So even if the person has done shuva, you still have that issue of the integrity of the shul. You do have that question, although I think just like in most or almost any other area of Torah life, um, we invite and we welcome and we encourage a person to be able to do tshuva. So sometimes tshuva is private, sometimes the tshuva can be identified or seen more publicly, but if a person, and time has passed, a lot of time you need time to heal, and, and the people who've been hurt, who've been victimized by those crimes, legally or just morally, um, have the victims who've been injured, are they willing to see it as authentic tshuva? Are they willing to allow that person to have a kibbutz in front of them? I think that often victims get the first or the final say on these issues because we don't want to re-trigger the pain that they've been through. Oh, interesting. Um, you, you mentioned before that this area of honesty, integrity, in particular in the workplace, is uh, not focused on enough that we uh, have to prioritize. Obviously, there are a lot of areas, especially as a Rav, that you're going to have to focus on in goading people on to improve their Torah observance, so Shemira Salashon and Kavan and Davening and Emunah and Shabbos. So why does integrity and honesty be, why is it oftentimes put in the back seat? 
Let's put it in the back seat because it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable, and people would rather not talk about it. They'd rather not hear it, and therefore I think a lot of Rabbanim and public speakers don't want to speak about the things that people don't want to hear. But I think that's the challenge of leadership is to sometimes make those who are comfortable uncomfortable and to challenge them to be the best version of themselves and to aspire to a higher standard, to realize a higher ideal and a higher goal. And I think that our generation, this is maybe even more critical than almost any that came before, not, not only because of our own integrity and how we conduct ourselves, not only because for us we should be engaged equally in Bein Adon L'Makam, Bein Adon L'Chavero, Bein Adon L'Atzma, these three realms of relationships are so important to our religious growth, religious identity, but because I think we're living in a time that there's a whole generation of young people who are evaluating their, their future relationship to Torah based on the emphasis we put on these things. They see a hypocrisy. They see a duplicity. They see that we measure religious life by very overtly religious activities and standards. And when it comes to ethics and when it comes to morals and when it comes to honesty and integrity, Davka, the people who maybe are the most outwardly religious, seem to be the most flexible and the most willing to blur or violate those lines. And that, I'm not, not alone, is responsible, but that has definitely contributed to so many people being uninspired, so many people who've walked away, so many people for whom Torah is not doing it for them. And I think that there Therefore, when we as a community place that emphasis, not only can we raise the community standards in general, not only can we, of course, realize the best version of ourselves as a community, as individuals, but I think we're securing our future. We're showing that next generation who are very socially, morally conscious however that's defined in the greater world, but they want to see that that's part of Torah too. We don't only care about the Ramatas, Malachas, and Kashas, which of course we care about and are fundamental to us, but equally we care about honest weights and measures. And the word toeva is not only used for the complicated areas of orientation and interpersonal relationships and intimacy, but the word toeva is used by the Torah also when it comes to dishonest weights and measures. And people who cheat on their tax returns and people who take things as, as business expenses when they're not, and people who are cutting corners in life and people who are stealing from their employers, that they are much as, a, as much as a toeva. That same word applies to them and that we're willing to use it and call them out as much as we are in other areas too. Right. I, I would assume it's not only for our own people who are in the community, but also when we're attempting to outreach out of the community, that when you have these scandals, big or small, that that is actually a, a pre preventer also from uh, being successful in Kiruv. For sure, so both both for recruitment in order to do Kirov and for retention in order to keep the people who are going through our yeshiva system and they're being raised and they're learning the sugyas and shafs that deal with exactly the ethics of Ashur Shinagach and so on. And then when they go into real life, they go into the, either their experience in the business place as a young person who's looking to some of the firmer, older people to mentor them or their experience in community life and they say, what I'm learning in yeshiva is not matching up to what I'm seeing in reality. I've learned about ethics in my musr Seder, but then I came and I saw someone getting a keyboard who everybody knows about them, that they cut corners, they're dishonest, that they're a ruthless person in business. And so we have to show them that the equal emphasis and that these areas, they have to match up both for for retention and to be able to be Makar. Look, our core mission as Jews is to be Ma'abek Fot Shemayim. What, what our life is all about is Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Baruch Hu put in place the system of Torah, and he said, here is a manual for living life not just in the shul of the base medrash, but going out into the world. Take it with you. And when you live life that way, righteously, in the world, you'll draw other people closer to me. They'll want to be more part of it. And when you're inconsistent and when you're hypocritical, you'll drive people further away. It's an absolute violation of our whole mission, of what we're here, what it's all about. Rabbi Goldberg, let me ask you a question. When somebody has an opportunity to make some money, there are opportunities that come up, either in business or in our private lives, and we see those opportunities out there. Human nature is to grab at that opportunity. What are your thoughts on that? Let's assume it's legal. Is that something that we should do or not? That's a great question. And the real question is, do we as a community want to measure everything we do by the strict letter of the law? If it's technically legal or if it's technically mutter, is that, is that the entire measure or barometer? Or do we have a higher standard? So the Torah tells us we have a higher standard. That the measure of whether we should do something or not is not just technically is it legal, but are we giving nachas ruach? Does it make Hashem proud? And that's what the Ramban tells us, is not just uh, the measure of the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. So there's a phenomenon today where you see people, we're so predisposed to want to take advantage of every bargain, of every deal, to save every penny that we can. And again, I understand what drives that for 
some that's necessity, and for others it's obsession. Um, I understand where it comes from, but are, are we are we doing it and are we fulfilling it in an ethical way? There are people who are manipulating airline mileage systems in a way that creates a big chil Hashem, where airlines have to cancel their their membership or their privileges because people are are taking far advantage or being too manipulative of it. We have a phenomenon when there's a glitch when a company or a website or a business makes a mistake. You know, we spread that out as far and wide as we can. We tell everyone quickly jump on it, buy it, save yourself some money. Is that Vasisa Yashar Vatov? We can have a whole halachic debate. We can have a whole legal debate whether that's something which is permissible, not permissible. But even if you can conclude it's permissible, is it right? Is the standard just legal or is the standard what's right and righteous and just what's giving nachas to Hashem? So, you know, and if that business were, were your brother's business, would you still run to tell everybody about the glitch and have them take advantage? Is it just because it's a corporation or it's a non-Jew or it's somebody else? So, again, what's the standard and what's our barometer? It says everything about us and, and it speaks volumes to the people who are watching. I heard a quote, I think it was ascribed to Rabbi Willig, that sometimes we have to say, even if it's mutter, it's usr. Oh, exactly, exactly. Through the prism of Asis Yashar Vatov. Is that a prism? Do we hold that up as a standard? Is that one of our measures? Right. Let me go in a different direction here. There's a question that I've been asked on a number of occasions, and I wanted to get your take on it, because I saw that you speak a lot about Emuna and Bitochon, and wanted to understand your take on how does that concept, belief that a Kaddish Baruch Hu supplies all of our Parnassa, coexist with the need for Hishtadlis? That is a great question, and it's been grappled with since the time the Torah was given and through each of the generations, and there's countless uh, svarim and literature on it, and it's hard to summarize in one phone call, not that I'm even holding entirely. But I would say this. I, I think we can simplify it by saying that emunah and bitachon, are, they're easy to have when the sitter's open, when the tehillim's open. They're easy to have even at the Shabbos table, so to say. They're easy to have in a in a religious environment. The question is, does emunah and do emunah and bitachon translate with us into our general life and into our general workplace. When they do, that's an affirmation or a validation that it's real, that it's authentic, that it's sincere. But when it stops at the exit of the shul, so I shuckle the hardest or have the longest shmona esrei, or I pour my heart into my tefillah, I say the pitta maktaras from my kwaf. I do all these schoolers in order to uh, invoke with Amunah, Kadosh Baruch Hu's uh, graciousness to me, but then I go into the business place and I'm ruthless and I'm unkind and I cut corners and, and I violate business ethics and, and I steal in taxes and I misreport and, and all of that, then where's the Amun Ambitachov? The Rishonim are very, very explicit in pointing out that um, if a person steals, you haven't only violated Ben Adam Lachaver, you violate Ben Adam Lamakum. Because if you believe a Kaddish Baruch Hu provides for us what we need, then you would never violate that boundary and take what he gave someone else. So the very act of stealing, of taking, of cutting corners, is in itself a, a, an act of heresy. We're denying the Rebona Shalom's life, uh, his, his role in, in our life. And there was a story, I, I wrote about this um, a year or two ago, but there was a story that, that brought to life for me, words the Chazanish has in a Sefer Amun and Bitachon. The Chazanish there describes that, you know, we use language, Baruch Hashem, Mirz Hashem, Chafte Hashem, we use all the language of Amun and Bitachon, and then when we go to work, the question is, do Amun and Bitachon animate and inform how we work, our professional lifestyle? And he talked about there, the Chazanish, he says, you know, if you have a competitor who moves in to the neighborhood, are, are you? Does it turn you into another kind of person? Do you become a ruthless businessman? Do you try to work with a distributor to cut that competitor out? Do you lower your prices? Do you do you go on the offensive and you just try to squash the competitor? If you really had a moon on bitachon, you'd realize that Hashem is enough to be able to give me parnasa and that person parnasa. Kadosh Baruch Hu can give everyone what they need. So the Chazanish uses language there. He describes that if you really believed in Hashem, you'd go across the street to the competitor and you'd offer to help him. Do you need me to make any introductions to you? Do you want to find? You want to use my Rolodex? How can I help? So I read that in Chazanish, and it represented sort of a lofty level. I can't imagine who could reach that level. But about a year ago, there was a story of a, of a fish market in Borough Park that a fire had destroyed the building, and it left that fish market, the person with no place to operate his business. And there was a similar store, another fish store a few blocks away, two from Yidden, two from Jews. And the, the fish store that was uh, still healthily, op- healthily operating actually reached out to the one whose business had burnt down and said, you know, until you get back on your feet, until they rebuild your store, why don't you come operate inside my store? 
you'll run your fish store within my fish store. It was an amazing, amazing story. He actually got a citation from New York State Assembly for that level of, of compassion and kindness. But that's not just compassion. The whole story made the news because of the kindness and compassion. To me, it makes the news because of the Amunah and Bitachon. For a competitor to say, come in my store. You can operate within my store side by side because I have such faith in the Rebona Shalom. He can provide for us, each of us, what we need. I'm not worried that you could take away from me, and I'm not trying to take away from you. So in this sense, how we act in business are we ruthless or are we generous? Are we gracious? Are we unkind? Are we honest or do we cut corners? Is in itself the greatest metric or measure of where we're holding in our amuna? Is it only in shul? Is it just in a religious setting or do we carry it with us everywhere we go? So if somebody is not honest on the job, what you're saying is that's an indication that he needs to work on his amuna. 100%. I think that's a symptom. The core illness is a lack of amuna. So the people who are out there, and I don't mean to minimize, I know there are people who are working incredibly hard just to put food on their table. We're not talking about people trying to buy the second, third, and fourth home or go away for Pesach. There are people who are facing the temptation to cut corners every day, not for a luxury, but just for the necessity of putting food on their table. And I don't want to ever minimize their plight or that struggle. But in the end of the day, where we find the strength to persevere and to overcome that struggle, to be honest, not only the letter of the law, but to be honest to the point of above the letter of the law, to the point which we don't talk about in our circles, but are we careful about making long-distance phone calls? Are we careful about how much we use the copy machine? Are we careful this time of year about you know how many businesses will tell you the amount of school supplies that go missing from the business because the employees are taking it home for their children to start the school year? Are we careful about the postage and sending personal things from work? Are we careful about how much time we interrupt in the middle of the day to check social media or make a phone call? All those questions are questions that are halacha, kosher, mishpa questions, which hopefully you'll continue to cover in this show and beyond. But the point is, if we're struggling with those questions, what gives us the strength to persevere and to endure and to always do that right thing is to have Amunah and faith in Hashem that this won't cost me in the long run. If I do the right thing, I'll always win out. If I take the high road, I'll never run into traffic, I like to say. And I think it's a struggle for everyone, even non-businessmen. I could tell you as a Rav that we sometimes, you know, you, you get a honorarium for a speaking engagement. You get an honorarium. Sometimes you uh, participate, you officiate at a simcha. It could be a levaya, it could be a, a, um, a wedding. The question is, do you report that as income? Nobody will ever, ever know if you don't report that in income. It could be a small gift, but there are laws. You've got to speak to your accountant, and you have to operate within the laws, because operating within the laws in this area is operating within the halacha. So even as Rabbanim, Tamid HaChachamim, even as the people in, involved in, in Avodah HaKodesh, we face and we confront that struggle also. So when you're deciding, should I, should I report this $100 um, gift or honorarium? You know, what, what you stand to save in terms of not reporting it, is so little compared to the Olam Haba that you're going to forfeit. And you have to believe that Kosh is going to reward you multifold for whatever you gave up if you were to dishonestly uh, fail to report it. So we all, we all struggle with this area, and I think it's a great barometer of where we're holding in our Amunah and Bitachon is the strength that we have in order to be able to overcome in that struggle. I actually read that Rav Schwab was so strict on recording everything that he even used to record the birthday presents that he received on his tax return. And uh, the IRS was skeptical about uh, somebody who had such low income and was given so, giving so much charity, so he was audited. And the auditor on behalf of uh, the IRS came in, and Rav Schwab had somebody from his community, an accountant, represent him. And the uh, accountant went through everything. And in the end of the day, Rav Schwab had appropriately and properly recorded everything, more than anyone else has ever recorded. So the uh, auditor sent him a letter afterward that Rav Schwab had revived his belief in humanity. It's an incredible story. I, I know somebody who um, was audited three times by the IRS because the amount of stucca he gave was a flag and attracted their attention because nobody gives charity. He must be lying and stealing on his tax return in order to take so many charitable contributions. So there's an opportunity for Kiddush Hashem and Chilu Hashem exactly in this venue, in this area. And I can't emphasize enough, and I'm speaking personally for me and my own Avodah Hashem, and I think for the people around us who want to see Torah and Amuna as informing everyday life, inspiring everyday life. To me, this is the barometer. This is it. This is where we measure. This is where the rubber meets the road about, is this just um, surface 
deep or is it real? Does it, does it touch our character? Does it mold and shape us into moral, ethical people? And there's so much at stake. Our own integrity is at stake. And as I said, the people who are watching us, both the Kirov we want to do and, and the young people, our children, who we want to retain to believe that, that Torah molds us and shapes us and elevates us, enriches us into being, into being better people, more moral people, more ethical people, that we should be repulsed by the people who externally look so religious and then when it comes to business ethics are willing to cut corners. You know, if you're going to be choshesh for a das yachid in hechaz kashras, hechaz shabbos, when it comes to other areas of halacha, if we're going to adopt a chumra system where we find a, a das yachid, a shitas yachid, and we're going to be choshesh for that shita, then we should similarly, equally, or maybe even more, be choshesh for a das yachid when it comes to choshen mishpat, when it comes to hechaz gzela, when it comes to hechaz kiddush Hashem. And that's, there's, there's a lot of people watching. And the Rebona Shalom watching, the young people around us are watching, non-Jewish world is watching and evaluating us, and most of all, our own neshama is counting on us to do the right thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to hear you're a rough of a massive, massive shul. If you were to rank the shilas you get by the, the, the most that you get to the least, give me the top five, for example, the most common shilas raking on down. Well, definitely, you know, the, the normal... Shilas range from, you know, Milchik Fleshik dishwashers and Hilchas Kashras issues um, to Hilchas Shabbos issues and Tarsa Mishpacha issues. And and Chazshul Mishpat business ethic questions are up there. People who are who have a, a finely calibrated moral compass will come and ask that question. They'll think it through, whether the fact that they got too much change in a store or they're concerned about something with, with their employer and how many hours they owe them. Um, so there are lawyers who've talked about how to do billing and, and some of the practices about rounding out numbers within billing and how do you keep track of it and what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. So people with finely tuned moral compasses, I think, are more attuned to ask those questions, but they don't nearly come in at the volume of these other shilas. Shilas and kashras and hilchas pesach and taras mishpacha and, and hilchas shabbos, they come in around the clock, and these areas are unfortunately way too far and few, few and far between. Right. What I what I found is that there are some people that ask a lot of shilas, and most people don't ask. Yes. In other words, the people with the finely tuned moral compass ask a lot of questions in this area, which is just evidence that the shilas come up often. And the people who who don't ask, it's not because the questions aren't coming up; it's because it's easier to not notice them and to not ask them. Right. But it says, every, it says everything about us. Yeah, I, I'll tell you something else which is amazing, which which always struck me as an amazing Rambam, because. Um, we know that when Yaakov leaves Lavan, um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu visits Lavan and tells him, hands off, don't touch my Yaakov, which is astounding, because why would Hashem visit his countenance on, on such a wicked person as Lavan? But the Tanchuma says it was in the schus of Yaakov. And what's the schus? Mikan anu lemeidim she schus malacha omedes b'makom she'en schus avos yichol alamod. So we, we talk about yichus all the time. We talk about schus avos. We talk about a person's uh, pedigree. But you know what's even greater than your, than your yichus or your pedigree? is chus malacha, what kind of work ethic you have, what kind of honesty you have. And the Rambam in the 13th parak of Hilchas Chirus, when the Rambam talks about Yaakov Avinu, when he, talk, when he talks about the obligation, Hilchas Chirus, that the, employee, the employer can't steal the wages of the employee, but the employee also has to be very very cognizant, very mindful, not to be stealing from the employer. And who's the example he gives Yaakov? And he calls Yaakov in that halacha, he calls him Yaakov HaTzadik. We usually refer to Yosef as Yosef HaTzadik, but the Rambam calls Yaakov Yaakov HaTzadik. And Yaakov's not a tzadik because he's an Ishtar, um, or because of he's a masmid in the base medrash. Yaakov's not a tzaddik because he shuckles the most as the longish one. Right? For the Rambam, Yaakov's a tzaddik because of schus malacha, because he's the most honest at work, because he has the greatest work ethic, because he's the most truthful, because he carries himself with that integrity. So what we, what we define in our communities and what we hold out, who are the poster tzaddikim? For our children and our families, based on the kibudim we give, who we honor at our at our events, um, and who we show covered to, who we call a tzaddik will tell everything to our children and to the next generation. Right. If we're giving those aliyahs and the kibudim and the honors at the dinners to those who uh, don't have the best of his business ethics, that's not uh, the right message then. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Any final thoughts that you can tell our tzibur? Uh, I think that we need to work on all these areas simultaneously. They're not easy. The Gemara Chazal already talked about the fact that every day we all struggle with Gezel, and uh, we don't put What's our hands. Yeah, we don't put our hands in other people's pockets and steal their wallet. 
Most of us are way too ethical to ever do that. But what Chazal were telling us is that the ethical dilemmas we face every day, if we're if our eyes are open to them, we would realize that our lives are filled with them. So, and, and they say everything about us in the end of the day. And so, uh, hopefully, we can we can rise to the challenge and we can grow in all these areas of life. But hopefully, have that amuna, that faith in Hashem, to be able to carry ourselves with that level of dignity and class that will speak the most to the greatest volume for ourselves and also inspire the next generation and and ultimately be marbek for and create the kiddush Hashem we all aspire to do. Amen, Rav Goldberg. What a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thanks for including me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Joining us now is Rabbi Yona Rees, who is currently the Av Basting of the CRC. That's the Chicago Rabbinical Council. He's the author of Confeona, which are contemporary shilas. It discusses basting issues. He's a former dean of Reitz at Yeshiva University and still a Ram teaching Smicha students. He goes back and forth at least once a month. He was the director of the Base Dean of America and also started out as an attorney at a major New York firm. Rav Reis, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So our, our discussion is going to be broad but limited in the sense that we're going to talk about Hoshin Mishpat issues at the workplace and we'll get into use of company assets and company time and the like, but I think it would be helpful before we dive into those issues if we can frame the conversation by defining the isurim that we're going to be grappling with, potentially isurim we're going to be grappling with, for example, theft, geneva, gazela, what's the amount, what if it's just a little bit, Jew versus non-Jew, if this it's our employer, what if I work for a company, what if I work for a massive company, does it really matter as opposed to an individual? So Geneva, Gezela, Geneva Stas, and any other of the fundamentals that we can explain first before we start going through the uh, specifics of our topic. Absolutely. Uh, the Mesilas uh, Hisharim writes in the paragraph, uh, Yud Aleph, uh, that uh, just like Gezel, Chepet uh, is Gezel, Gezel's man is also considered to be Gezel. And he writes about how a worker has to be extremely conscientious uh, to uh, utilize every single moment of a work time uh, to maximize uh, the work effort. And if uh, the uh, worker uh, is uh, somebody who slacks off in any way, uh, then uh, that is uh, just as much a violation of Gezela as uh, taking uh, an object uh, from uh, somebody else. And uh, the Rambam writes uh, that uh, a worker is Muzar Shlul Yibatil Me'at Khan Me'at Khan, that uh, it all adds up. If uh, somebody uh, decides to slack off uh, a minute here, a minute there, uh, it all uh, combines uh, to end up uh, being an act of gazela from one's employer who is supposed to be guided by the example of uh, Yaakov Avinu, about whom it is written in the Torah, Ki Bechol Kochi, Avati Es Avichen, that with every ounce and fiber of his strength, he worked uh, for his boss. His boss was loving, even though it wasn't a very nice boss. Nonetheless, he was a very conscientious uh, worker. So that's one form of Gezela uh, that doesn't always occur to people, and that's uh, Gezel's man that a Pole is being uh, paid for uh, every single moment of his or her time, and therefore they have to work industriously. There's also the other uh, very boilerplate type of gazela of uh, taking items from one's employer, office supplies, uh, without permission. It cannot be presumed uh, that an item is uh, allowed to be taken unless it is official company policy, The one is allowed to take uh, paper or stationery or stamps or use the copy machine for uh, personal purposes or whatever it uh, may be. The default presumption has to be that if it's not for a business or work of purpose and it's not your property, that you're not allowed to take uh, that uh, property away. It does not matter whether the employer is Jewish or non-Jewish. We paskin that Gezel Akum is Aser, Genevas Akum is Aser, whether the rice or the rabbanon with respect to gazela is an interesting discussion within the Rambam, but it doesn't really matter at the end. It's all usher. One's not allowed. It's not completely prohibited uh, to steal from Jew or non-Jew alike. It doesn't matter whether we're dealing with an individual or a company. A company is made up of lots of different individuals, and gazela is certainly applicable uh, with respect to, to a company as well. And it doesn't matter 
with respect to the amount. While the Chiyav Hashava, an obligation of a Heshev is a Gezeva, might be applicable only to a Shava Pruta, with respect to a Jew at least, uh, nonetheless the Isser is applicable even to a Pachos Mishava Pruta, even to the most uh, minute amount. Uh, if it's something that uh, nobody would be mocked about, uh, the, like a, a match or a toothpick, uh, even then there's a, a midas chasidus, uh, the one's not supposed to take it, uh, so it really is a pretty absolute prohibition, just as a starting point. That, that sounds fairly draconian, so if we try to apply that, uh, I get a personal call at work, my kid calls and there was an emergency, or... I need to write down a phone number at work for my personal use, and I want to use the company pen. You know, that's a mashu, the ink. Or I need to copy something, send off a fax, although they don't use faxes nowadays anymore. Just charging my phone at work. Like, it can't possibly be that I can't do any of that because the standard is it's a gazela and I'm going to steal a little here and there. Is there an overall standard that will tell us, or is it really all prohibited? There is a general principle that is really at the very opening of Hilchos Spiris Poalim in Shulchan Aruch. You look in Simon Shin Lamed Aleph based on uh, the Mishnah and Gemara in Masechet's Baba Metzia of Hakol Kamina Gemedina. Uh, that everything is dependent upon whatever is the prevailing custom. A worker can work with the assumption if there is a prevailing custom that one can take a call, for example, or that uh, there are certain types of uh, supplies, like a pen, that uh, you're given by your work, and uh, you're not necessarily expected to switch pens whenever you need to jot something down for personal purposes, especially if it's ultimately going to benefit uh, the employer uh, that uh, you engage in uh, these uh, types of uh, minor and uh, uh, insignificant uses, uh, so then you're entitled uh, to follow the minog, and even if it's not explicitly stipulated when you're hired uh, that you have these rights, if it's understood in this particular type of business, this particular type of office, this particular type of profession, uh, that uh, this is the minog, uh, then you can take advantage uh, of that uh, of that minog. But the uh, most of the rights that a person might have to take a telephone call or something of that sort are based on a principle that's also articulated in the in the Shulchan Aruch, in a Simon Shin Laman Zion, Sif Yud Aleph, uh, that what Rabbi Aaron Levine, uh, Zichron of the Bacha, used to refer to as uh, the net benefits principle, uh, that Shetovu Lebalabayis Kedei Shelo Yisbatil. That there are certain dispensations uh, that are for the that are for the are for the benefit of the employer. Uh, that if they wouldn't allow certain things, uh, then a, a worker uh, might not uh, be able to function uh, properly. They might have to leave the office uh, to go home to make a call, which would cause uh, even more of a burden. So those types of things uh, can be allowed, but again, in minimum measure. The Gemara tells a story of a delegation of rabbis that came to Abba Chilkia. Who is Abba Chilkia? He was referred to as Poel Tzedek. The Gemara at the end of Marco says that David HaMelech, uh, condensed or the 613 mitzvahs into 11 principles, and one of them was Poel Sedek, an honest, righteous laborer. And um, Abichilkia was the personification of a Poel Sedek. And uh, there's a story in Gemara Tainus that speaks of a delegation of rabbis that came to him. They wanted him to pray for rain, and he didn't even return their greeting. When they came to him, he did not uh, turn their, his face uh, to them. Uh, when they greeted him, and when they asked him at the end of the day why that was, he said that uh, he was a, a skir yom, he's a day of labor, and uh, he felt a low ifker, that uh, it was important for him uh, not to, to in any way uh, slack off uh, from his work, and uh, therefore he didn't want to take even the slightest moment uh, to respond to them. So Rabbi Levine writes that if you look at Rashi, uh, Rashi doesn't indicate that he didn't necessarily respond to the greeting, just that he didn't turn his face away from his work. Uh, that if somebody gets a call in the middle of the day, it's, uh, might, it might be appropriate to take the call and just say, please call me after hours. Uh, most employers will not want their employees to take personal calls and to engage, unless it's an emergency situation, in an extensive conversation, but it might be appropriate to take a call and simply say, please call me at a later point in time. 
this is in fact uh, something uh, which uh, is articulated in the uh, Sefer uh, Hasidim. Other people are supposed to know this as well, not to approach workers during the time in which they are busy with their work. It's a two-way street that a person owes as much of a duty of diligence during these official working hours not to take time uh, to engage in personal conversations. But if it is a quick comment or a quick um, the call uh, back to one's wife or something of that sort that an employer will understand uh, is important to the overall well-being of uh, the worker to enable them just to function normally. A person can do what's the bare minimum, but they have to be careful not to abuse the privilege. Right. Now, if we're looking at Abba Chokia, who said, Schir Yom, I was working on the day. I had set hours, in other words. I was paid for my time. There are many people out there that don't have jobs that are nine to five. They have undefined hours, like if you're at a law firm, an investment bank, accounting firm. In sales, oftentimes you don't have set hours. You just work and work and work, and uh, it's it's undefined. So would these same limitations apply that I have to be so strict about my time if I'm not sold my time exactly because I don't have defined time? Obviously, there's a difference between somebody who is a regular poel who works by the day and somebody who's a cobbler and is a contractor who's simply supposed to get the job done. A person just wants to make sure the cobbler gets the job done in a timely fashion whenever that time frame is stipulated, but the cobbler doesn't owe the same duty of being available every single moment of every day. Uh, there is a misconception, I think, with respect to poelim nowadays, uh, especially since uh, there is a, a greater expectation, even according to the Minag of Medina, for people to uh, be uh, available uh, outside of regular office hours that maybe regular office hours don't matter as much. I think regular office hours do matter. Uh, I think there still is an expectation in most firms that during the time period that you have the support staff there, uh, that uh, you have the office fully functioning, that's the main time in which the workers are expected to be fully available for meetings that may be called, for phone calls that may come in, and things of that variety. Uh, when I used to work in uh, my law firm and people would want to call me, I would say to them, look, I'm generally here in the law firm. I used to work typical uh, Wall Street hours as an associate. I would often be there past 10 p.m. at night, past midnight, uh, and I would tell people that if you want to call me, uh, it's certainly not expected that I'll never take a call at work because if I'm working, you know, after hours, obviously I'm uh, allowed to have a life. Um, uh, but don't call me until after 5.30 because the official office hours were 9.30 to 5.30. So I said, call, you can call me after 5.30 because after that point in time, there generally aren't the regular official meetings and there's a little bit more flexibility. I could take a supper. I could go out. Uh, and uh, do whatever I need to do at that point in time. It's just a question of staying late in order to get my work done, but I can also live my life. Uh, however, uh, I, it, it's generally the case that during regular hours, people are expected to be there. Uh, sometimes workers make a mistake. You know, the, the post in the Sefer Chesidim talks about how an employer might be embarrassed to tell an employee off if an employee is engaged in a conversation when they really should be working. And therefore, it's more the employee's responsibility not to engage in that conversation uh, in the first place. Um, but sometimes you'll have a, a worker who will just go and say to the employer, oh, you know, normally I work from, uh, nine, um, from 9 to 5, uh, and uh, I... Um, uh, and I take a lunch uh, in the middle. Today I'm going to skip my lunch and I'm going to leave at 4 o'clock. Uh, and they just announce it. And the employer is embarrassed to say anything like, well, I, I, I actually need you until 5 o'clock today. <laughs> and there's an expectation. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take lunch. That's your business. Uh, but it's not up to you to decide, oh, today I'm going to work from 8 to 4, from 7 to 3 because I want to leave early. Sometimes workers make a mistake in that regard. There is an expectation that during regular hours, a worker is really going to be there. Uh, it's very important for people not to make this mistake. I've had workers who uh, would say, I don't feel so well today. I'm going to stay home. Oh, but by the way, I'm available. If you need me for anything, you can call me. 
And then I've discovered afterwards that the worker has not declared that as a sick day or as a day that they took off from work because they said, oh, I can be reached if you need me. The only problem is that there's very little that they will be capable of doing once they're home. They're not part of the action. And people will sometimes take these types of liberties and abuses. It's a big mistake. Right. There's an interesting uh, interesting memo that Ace Greenberg, Ace Greenberg was the chairman of Bear Stearns, so he was known to be a stickler about these type of things. So he once sent out a memo about sick days, and he said as follows, I quote it, No excuse. We will no longer accept your doctor's statement or note as proof. It is clear that if you are well enough to get to the doctor's office, you are well enough to come to work. I, so, uh, I, I, I don't... Uh, so there's, uh, I can't comment on, you know, that type of thing is uh, sort of beyond the pale. There's such a thing as being a reasonable boss and employer as well, where you do have a minigamoko. Part of that is that people have the right to be human. Part of being human is that you're sick. If you're sick, you get to go to the doctors. The Gemara and Baba Kama says that's the normal course of life, that a person who doesn't feel well goes to the Bayasya, he goes to a doctor. Uh, that doesn't derogate from the fact that the person is sick. So an employer also has to uh, be reasonable. They don't have the right to change the terms of employment or to change the minigamokum after a worker has already been hired. They want to change the terms before they hire somebody so a person can make an intelligent decision whether they want to work for such a firm. I would imagine most people wouldn't want to, uh, but uh, certainly they can't change uh, the rules once a person has already begun working. Right. Now, now, what you were saying was that once you're on the job, it's not up to the employee to say, I'm going to go forego my lunch and I'm going to leave early. Would you say the same thing? Somebody says, I want to take a little bit more time of a breather during the day because I, frankly, when I get home, I'm still on email. Nowadays, the line between personal and business is very blurry. So I continue working at home. So I want a little bit more flexibility during the day as well. Both of our lives are merging, personal and business. Is there more flexibility on this nowadays? I think it really depends on the office culture. There are some uh, cultures in certain types of work where there isn't even much of an office. Everybody's sort of you know, working during whatever time they're able to, uh, to carve out, and there's just uh, much more flexibility that everybody makes their own hours, and that's how the, um, that's how the business operates. If that's the nature of the business, obviously a person can follow uh, the minute of uh, the firm. Uh, but if it is a more traditional office environment, it's just that people happen to have their cell phones and they're sometimes contacted after hours, so then that requires a question to be asked. Uh, nothing can be taken for granted. A person has to go to their supervisor and they have to say to them, uh, do I have the right to, to take uh, on occasion uh, more of a breather during the day because I know that I'm going to be needed at night or maybe there's a specific day where they're being, being called in for an important uh, meeting or conference call at night, so they ask, would it be okay if I take off two hours a day? It's always okay to ask. But if there isn't a clear-cut culture and a clear-cut minog, then you can't take anything for granted. The Shulchan Aruch says that in order for it to qualify as a minog, it has to be something which comes up regularly, and already there has been an established pattern, an established policy over a long period of time. Right. So just to drill down on the standard, we're hearing Minaga Medina, which literally means the Minaga of the country or the city. And then there's an industry standard, which maybe is more applicable nowadays. There's a standard in certain industries and not other industries. Or my specific employer, maybe he has a different standard than the Minaga Medina or the industry standard. Maybe he's stricter. Maybe he's more lenient. So which is the standard that we need to adhere to? You start off with a default assumption of uh, Minaga Medina. Minaga Medina helps to define uh, work hours and the like. If it's not stipulated otherwise, somebody who gets hired nowadays in America has the right to assume that they're generally not going to be required to show up before 9 and they're generally not going to be relieved of their work if they're a full-time employee uh, until uh, at least after uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, but then, uh, if uh, you get beyond what we call, you know, minig of Medina, there's also minig of an industry. So if a person works for an industry where they're a bond dealer and the expectation is that they're going to show up at 8 in the morning, so then that becomes uh, controlling when it's very clear that uh, the minig of this industry varies in various ways from the minig of Medina. And then, when you get more specific with respect to a particular firm, if a particular firm is going to be different from the minig of Medina, it's going to be different even from the minig of the general industry, um, so as long as it is clearly spelled out 
uh, at the time in which a person is hired, so then uh, that employee would be bound by all of the rules and regulations and protocols of that particular employer. So if my boss is stricter about my time or use of supply, somebody told me he was working at an investment bank and his boss didn't want to go out to hit him to go out to Minion, but the industry standard would be people can go out a little bit during the day, but my boss is stricter or my employer is stricter, then we'd have to adhere to the dictates of my specific employer. You would have to. It's um, you know generally assumed uh, in Shulchan Aruch that despite the fact that the Gemara uh, says that when people uh, bench, uh, they uh, if they're at work, then uh, they only say the first bracha and they combine together the second and third bracha and skip the fourth bracha entirely. And when they say Shemona Esrei, uh, they just uh, stay a short and abridged version known as Havinenu. That uh, nowadays uh, the employers uh, are not makpid, they're not uh, so. Um, they're not uh, so uh, strict uh, that uh, they would not allow a worker to bench fully or to say Shmona Esri fully. Most can talk about what if you have an employer who really is so strict. So then you'd have to mm-hmm. ask a Shiloh. But it generally doesn't come up because it's very rare uh, that you would have an employer that uh, hires somebody in a way that they wouldn't be able to at least uh, uh, take a lunch break that would enable them to say a full um, uh, mitcha, for example, uh, or uh, take the time to um, to bench uh, relatively quickly. Uh, however, uh, certainly if there is uh, an employer who makes these demands and it's known at the time of employment, uh, then it's something uh, that uh, the uh, employee uh, would uh, have to uh, take seriously. So if I don't know my company, my boss's uh, requirements, but I know the industry standard is, I can use a little bit of my time, I can use a little bit of the office supplies, I don't have to bother asking my boss then. Office supplies are really a, a, a serious issue. Using, uh, t- taking a call at work and things of that variety where there's sort of a, a plan, you're not adding to the money, you're not uh, stealing anything per se, it's just a question of um, the how you spend uh, your time. Uh, so uh, there, uh, there are certain uh, what we might call a, a reasonableness or uh, standards uh, regarding you know the rules that fall into the category of what ultimately is going to uh, maximize the benefit of your boss that we can assume uh, that your employer would allow you to do. When it comes to actually taking a, a supply and using it, uh, I don't think you can make any assumptions. People sometimes say, well, everybody does it, therefore it must be okay. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes everybody might be uh, abusing their um, their privileges. They might be. Uh, you might have a lot of people in the office who are using uh, the copy paper in order to uh, just um, copy uh, their own um, uh, materials uh, to uh, satisfy their own hobbies and the like, and that's not really considered uh, to uh, to be appropriate. Uh, so when it comes to these matters, um, there are certain types of items. I think like a pen that you don't have to constantly change between the office pen you know, and your regular pen, like I mentioned. Uh, but when it comes to office supplies, using a stamp to send a personal letter, I, I never assumed that it's something that I could do. If I ever needed to send a personal letter and I needed to take a stamp, I paid for the stamp. Uh, I, I, I don't see why a person would be entitled unless it's uh, explicitly uh, stipulated uh, that uh, it would be uh, permitted. Um, when I came to this job, for example, where I'm working right now, I'll give you uh, an example. At the CRC. So I have a, at the CRC. So I have a law degree. Uh, so the law degree is uh, something which I feel objectively is helpful in terms of my standing as a dying that I can get up and I can give lectures uh, and um, be able to speak with authority, not only from the standpoint of halakha, but even secular law because I'm a licensed attorney. So I asked the question, uh, will the um, uh, will the CRC pay for uh, my uh, lawyer registration that I have to uh, fill out every two years as a certain registration fee? And they said uh, quite uh, um, candidly uh, that uh, it's very nice that I have this qualification. They're not sure if it's something which uh, enhances my performance as a dian as the post here at the, the CRC. Um, so they asked. They told me that it was good that I asked, but probably something I should pay for when I came here. After I was here, I'm already here for six years. So after I was here for several years, 
and they saw me speaking at lots of different conferences, the Decalogue Society here in Chicago, various continuing legal education programs that were sponsored by rabbinic organizations, and they saw how it does increase value in terms of my work as a die, and they said, oh, now that you've, have, you've demonstrated over time that this is something that gives us you know, additional value, so we'll pay for your lawyer registration fee. Sometimes that there are dispensations that, that will be granted along those lines to more senior employees when they show that there are certain uses that may have seemed like they were strictly personal or actually for the benefit of the firm uh, or the company. This is something that can be negotiated over time, but you certainly can't work with these assumptions to begin with. I hope they gave it back to you retroactively. <laughs> I, I wouldn't ask for it. I'll right. send an email. <laughs> so, so just to get back to the, the use of the coffee machine, yeah, if there's a Minigam Medina, and I would think that it's, there is a, an industry custom, something that's acceptable to print out something at work, if it's a so, small amount or something like that, it seems to be saying you're being more machmir than that, and you have the view that using the copy machine, the printer, to print out anything would require the consent of the boss. I, I, I really think that it varies from company to company. I, I don't know that there is a clear-cut uh, Minaga Medina when it comes to making copies for personal uh, purposes. Uh, I think it's uh, the sort of thing which uh, every single person uh, should get a sense when they enter into the firm. They can ask around in terms of what's the, the what's 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 the minute. They'll generally be told that there's a reasonableness a standard. Uh, that if it's going to uh, just to be efficient, you need to you know copy something. You don't have a copier at home. Uh, it's uh, a you're, you're you're preparing maybe a. Uh, maybe you need to uh, fill out the, your the tax returns, or you need to make a copy of your latest pay stub or W-2 you know, statement or something of that sort, uh, that uh, there's a minute to allow it. But I don't take anything for granted, I'll be honest with you, um, because uh, I could certainly see that there may be certain firms where uh, there's a hakpad about these things. Uh, whenever, you're, uh, whenever you're utilizing an office supply, I think uh, that you have to uh, discipline yourself uh, to ask questions because otherwise, uh, as the Rambam says, you know, it's going to be me'at kan or me'at kan, <laughs> a little bit here, a little bit there, and uh, suddenly uh, it might turn into very serious uh, abuse. Uh, so uh, if there is a minog, uh, then um, uh, uh, it's good uh, to uh, just make sure that uh, you um, subtract a little bit from uh, what you think the minog is, like I saw Rabbi Belsky said, uh, in order uh, to ensure that you not uh, go overboard uh, in terms of uh, your taking advantage. Right. So, so if somebody has taken supplies in excess of the industry standard in the past, how, how do you make amends? And let's say I don't even work at the place anymore. The ownership has changed. How, how, do, how can we make up something like that that we should not have done in the, in the past? It's really a very difficult uh, question. Uh, the uh, uh, in, in many cases, if you are a worker in good standing in the company and uh, you discover that you made a mistake, uh, that you availed yourself perhaps a little bit too much of what you thought the minog was, and you just go to your supervisor and ask the question, do I need to uh, make it up? Do I need to reimburse? They'll say, don't worry about it. Just be more careful in the future. You're asking the question, the person's uh, no longer uh, working there uh, altogether. Uh, I, um, I don't know how to answer the question. I would think that if it's sort of a uh, de minimis type of calculation where the person's not sure, they think that the, you know maybe they uh, abuse the privilege, but uh, if it would be, if it's true, it probably wasn't anything extraordinary. So it's probably the sort the sort of thing uh, that uh, the uh, that the company uh, takes into consideration that these things will happen, and uh, there's a presumed mechila in many many cases. If it's something which is uh, much more serious in nature, uh, that uh, you stole a, a piece of furniture, so you should. Give it back, <laughs> or <laughs> something right. of a very serious, you know, something substantial. Uh, look, I, I remember that when I left my law firm, uh, so I, I noticed uh, that uh, they continued for the next couple of months uh, to um, to um, uh, send um, money to my investment account, uh, which was sort of an auto automatic um, uh, automatic uh, uh, pay. 
has it. Uh, that uh, that, that uh, it was just uh, automatically registered into my account. So I called up my firm and I said, I think you made a mistake. And they said, oh, thank you very much for pointing it out. We wouldn't have noticed. This is the amount that we overpaid you in terms of the auto pay. Uh, and uh, we would like, uh, and, and here's how much uh, you should make out the check to pay us back. So I did it. And then about five months later, I was still working part-time it happens in my law firm because when I left the law firm to become director of the Besden, they asked me to stay on part-time. Whenever I would have some time at night to work for a few hours, they pay me by the hour, very, very nice. So uh, I was still working part-time. And then the end of December, I noticed that there was another uh, auto-pay amount that was registered, registered into my investment uh, account, which would have been the bonus uh, that was given to all of the associates at the end of uh, the year. So I had a question mark in my head. Maybe I said that since I'm still working part-time and I'm contributing value, they decided to give me a bonus. But maybe it's a mistake because they just did it automatically and forgot to terminate it uh, because um, and they uh, forgot to, for a moment that I'm no longer a full-time employee. So I decided I would call up and ask them. And they said, it's good that you asked because we only really intended to give the bonus to the full-time employees. That really it was a mistake. So I gave that back as well. So you have to distinguish between sort of the de minimis uh, items uh, and uh, things that are of real substance. If it's something of real substance, so you have to figure out how to get contact the employer and uh, to um, and to give it back somehow. Mm-hmm. Is this something you can make a Tzorche Rabim donation to Tzedakah with? Because, uh, you know, rather than going back or if it's the, the ownership change to the company or something, you don't know the amount, so you give a donation to the shul or a Tzorche Rabim. You donate a library depending on uh, how much you feel that you owe. Is that is that a possibility or not a possibility? If the company is still around, even in some sort of successor entity form, so it seems to me that's really where the money should go. We're not talking about where you just stole from a lot of people and you don't even know who they are anymore. You know exactly who it is. So you know who it is. You should try to give it back to them. Right, right, right. Now, you have a unique perspective having worked both in the secular world and at a yeshiva and a base team. Are the issues that we're talking about – use of time, use of assets, are they the same at each of those areas that you've worked at? At least the principles are the same, or are there differences between them? Well, there's uh, an even you know, greater uh, obligation when dealing with a, 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 uh, a Tzorche Rabin type of institution which is involved in a Vodas HaKodesh, so uh, once you're dealing uh, with um, a, the type of work, which is Malachas Hashem, you have the Pasuk in Yirmiyahu that says, Avoro se Malachas Hashem Rimiyah. There's a, a higher standard of uh, being extremely uh, alert, of uh, being uh, extremely uh, diligent, of uh, making sure that uh, one goes above and beyond uh, when you're dealing with Malachas Shemayim, when you're dealing with, uh, with God's work. Uh, and that's why the, you have uh, the um, Yerushalmi, the Rabbi Yochanan noticed that there was a uh, the Malam de Tinokos who was very weak. And he said, why are you weak? And the Malam de Tinokos said, because I like to engage in personal fasts a lot. And Rabbi Yochanan said uh, that you're not allowed to afflict yourself even if you were dealing with a Malachis or a Shus, even if you were dealing with something that was not uh, Tzorche uh, Shemayim, but that you're dealing with God's work, how much more so you have to take care of yourself in order to ensure that you give every ounce of your strength and energy and talent to the task. So there certainly is that notion of going even above and beyond uh, when one is engaged in Malecha Shemayim. Oh, that's a higher standard. Interesting. Okay, I just want to ask two more interesting questions, uh, questions that uh, were posed to me. One is uh, somebody was working in Toronto, and he says, I have to work 37 and a half hours per week, and he clocks in, clocks out. And when he does something personal, a phone call, lunch, he clocks out. He doesn't count that time. But the one thing I did not know about, he says, is how about – bathroom time. I have not been deducting bathroom time from the calculation. Is that something that should be on the clock, or is that not something should be on the clock? And uh, as the Diane, what would you respond to that question? Look, Lonin Natoa, the Malachi Ashari said certainly that the uh, workplace uh, was also not Nitna, the Malachi Ashari. We are hiring human beings. Human beings need to go to the bathroom. I think it's understood in any uh, type of uh, work, in any type of uh, working environment, that people will uh, need to go uh, to the bathroom. It's nice that the employers provide for bathrooms on the premises so we could save time, that people don't have to go to outhouses anymore and things of that sort. 
but uh, reasonable bathroom breaks are also in the category of what ultimately is good for the employer. It satisfies uh, the net benefits a principle of shetovu lebala bias kadeshal ho yisfatil that a person should be maximally functional. You can't expect that everyone will get rid of all their bathroom needs before they even show up uh, to work. Uh, everybody will need to go to some degree uh, over the course of uh, the work day. Uh, so I don't think that bathroom that anybody expects one to deduct bathroom breaks. If somebody happens to get very sick and they have a bad stomach and they're in the bathroom for a couple of hours, so obviously that's a different story. Then they're already in the category of cola, uh, where either it counts as a sick day or if they've used up their sick days, they don't get you know paid for that. Uh, but if it's a normal amount of time, that uh, I don't think needs to be deducted. At the same time, a person goes to the bathroom, they shouldn't go with their uh, smartphone uh, with them uh, so that they can surf the web uh, for an extra half hour more than they really needed to go to the bathroom. So that's also something that should be avoided. One other question. Sick days. How sick does somebody need to be in order to call in sick? In order to call in sick, a person should be should, should not feel well. It doesn't have to be a whole the shame, Bosokon, in the sense of being fully bedridden. It's just they don't feel 100%. If uh, a, a business uh, gives somebody a certain number of uh, sick days, uh, so then uh, they have the discretion whenever they uh, don't feel 100%, they need to, to uh, be able to recharge uh, their batteries, get their strength uh, back up. As long as it's within the regimen of sick days that they were given, it seems to me that they can take uh, the sick day. In my experience, the more conscientious uh, employees uh, will not look for excuses uh, to say, I have a sniffle, I'm not going uh, to come in. I think uh, that it's understood that people uh, don't have to feel 100%. How many people in this world feel 100% don't have some aches or pains uh, in order to come in? But if you have a, a type of condition where you're going to annoy people by sneezing on them, so it probably would be appreciated if you stayed home and didn't come into work. Right. Uh, but you right. shouldn't make up. Uh, you shouldn't make up sick days when it's not true. That would be really stealing from the employer. Right. All right, Rabbi Reese, this has been very helpful. Any any parting words for the Tzibor here? The um, notion of being a conscientious uh, worker is really, you know, one of the highest ideals that we have in our religion. We're told by the Gemara and Shabbos uh, that Le'acha Meir Esim, go up to Shemayim, the first question that we're going to be asked is, Nasasa Nasata Be'emuna. Uh, this is even before Kabati Itim Torah, And the question is, uh, the Tos was asked uh, elsewhere, uh, we're told that the Tochilas Dino Shaladam is al Divrei Torah, so how can it be that the first question that's asked is Nasasav and Nasasav Emuna, and there are different answers uh, that are given. So one answer that I always like to say is you don't have to get to the question of Kabat Yitim Torah if uh, the answer to Nasasav and Nasasav Emuna is no, because it shows that a person didn't really imbibe uh, the words of Torah that they were learning if uh, they don't understand uh, the supreme value of being a conscientious and honest worker. That's why question number one is, Nasasa Minasata Ben because that shows that you took the words of Torah to heart in terms of applying them to your life. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us, Rabbi Reese. It's been a pleasure having you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Joining us now is Avi Steinloff, CEO of Edmunds. Edmunds is one of the most popular automotive shopping sites in the United States for both new and used cars. The company has around 20 million visitors a month and has close to 600 employees. It's also been named one of the best places to work in Southern, Cali in Southern California for the past 10 years. Avi, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Great to be here with you. So, Avi, let me get you up to speed. We just had an amazing uh, discussion with Rabbi Yona Reese, who talked about the concepts that govern what employees can and cannot use on the job. For example, use of time on the job if they're on salary and that they want to use their time for some personal needs, or use of company assets, use of the company's Xerox machine or printer. And what he told us was there are different standards that have to be looked at. The minig of the Medina is what's the common, well, I'll use the term industry standard. He didn't use that term, but I'll use that term industry standard. That's more of an objective standard. For example, internet companies, law firms, accounting firms, that would be the industry. And more important than that, and what would override that, is if there is a company policy. That's, that's more of a subjective standard. What are the policies 
what's permitted and not permitted at my specific company that I work at. And we wanted to get Edmonds on the show and use Edmonds as a case study because I understand it's a fairly flexible and unusual environment. They have very different company policies that would enable or not enable employees to use their time and the assets of the company. So you know, why, why don't we start off as follows. What is the Edmonds policy as it relates to use of time I'm on the job, vacation, sick days, and the like. Sure. Well, for, for starters, I think we're we're certainly on the innovative side, uh, and being an internet company based in Southern California, uh, it's important for us, you know, to to be on the cutting edge, to both be able to attract and retain uh, talent, uh, oftentimes technical talent, and so. Something that we did uh, going back, it's got to be now maybe six, seven years ago, uh, is we adopted a policy called a results-only work environment, uh, where really the key to, to somebody's success uh, is, is, is arriving at the results. Uh, and, and what I mean by that, and, and this, is not, this is not something we made up, there are books written about it. There are other companies that have adopted uh, ROW, as we call it, for a results-oriented work environment, is we do not have core hours. Uh, we do not have a nine-to-five policy. We do not check people in and check people out. Um, what's important is getting uh, results. Uh, and, and again, depending on your role at the company and your responsibilities, uh, we'll determine what those results are. Uh, and the, the group that you work with and the people that you work with will help determine what those results are as well. And so this notion that, uh, uh, you know, you've got to check in and check out and count your hours, while that may exist in other companies and in other industries, uh, does, does not exist uh, at, uh, at Edmonds. Um, and one could say that we even have an unlimited vacation policy, uh, which is not technically true. Uh, but we don't give a certain number of days uh, that people can take vacation or that people can take as sick days after which they start to get penalized. We have what we call a time away from work policy where uh, people, you know, are, are expected to take a reasonable uh, amount of time off when they need it. And, and we're not going to stress over, you know, did they take it on these days or did they take it on those days? And so that I would say is the, uh, uh, the, the rubric under which we work and, and, and which we operate, and those would be considered our norms uh, at Edmonds. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it works for us. And, and, and then, you know, figuring out uh, how some of the, the setup that you had uh, earlier in our conversation would apply in our environment is something we can now discuss. So uh, is there a lot of abuse? I can imagine uh, having worked at various companies, if you tell people that you have no set hours and if you don't show up or you do show up, you can work for a home, you know, it's total flexibility. I, I would think there's a lot of abuse. Uh, the, the reality is, is that there is not. Uh, so having, you know, having, having been in this environment and having adopted this now for several years, uh, I would say that uh, uh, any of the abuses that occur are really on the fringes. Uh, and, and I would liken it candidly to the same types of people who, you know, used to cheat on their time cards. Uh, and could it exist? Sure, it could exist in theory. Does it exist in practice? Very, very minimally. Uh, and so, um, you know, what we do find is, and, and you know, I, I wouldn't tell you that literally every person that works at the company has been a great hire and, and always works out over the long run. That just isn't realistic. And so, if people, uh, you know, have joined us and, and are working but, but aren't, aren't really working out because they aren't achieving their results, uh, they're, they're not doing the job that they were hired to do, eventually, you know, between us and, and, and the employee, we figure that out and, and we work on some type of a transition plan out of the company. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what I'd consider to be hardcore or, uh, you know, egregious abuses uh, really do not occur very frequently and, and, and would really be the exception and not the norm. Interesting. And when it comes to supplying food, meals, even often supplies, I know that uh, – the Google standard, maybe the industry standard, is to supply a lot that a conventional company 
would not otherwise supply. So what's uh, the admin's company policy on that? So I, I think, you know, I think we're, we're generous, certainly from our perspective. We have all different types of coffee that we make available. We have a Coke freestyle machine. Uh, we provide fruit in the morning. We provide bagels and cream cheese on Friday. Uh, we have yogurts, individual yogurts that people can take out of the fridge and uh, milk for cereal and, and, and cereal that we make available. So, so things along those lines. And uh, we don't tell you you can only have X number or Y number. I think there's a certain expectation uh, that uh, people are adults. We treat them like adults and, and that they should be reasonable. Uh, so, you know, if somebody has six cups of coffee a day, I, you know, <laughs> that may not be great for their health, but, uh, but I certainly would not have a problem with that. Uh, if somebody has a few yogurts a day because that's, you know, that's what they want to do. Uh, also would have no problem with that. I probably would have a problem if somebody went into the fridge and, you know, took 30 of them <laughs> and took them home because uh, I think that would that would be considered egregious. Uh, uh, but but th it doesn't really happen. Uh, and so I, I think there, you know, there are a certain set of norms uh, that uh, I would almost consider to be self-policing uh, in that, uh, you know, you're in an environment with uh, with 600 other people and uh, people want to fit in and, and feel as if, uh, you know, what they're doing is, uh, uh, is, is, is normal. Nobody wants to be seen hoarding yogurts as an example. So, right. uh, you know, it, 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 I, I would be hard pressed to say, you know, two is fine and three is no good or three is fine and four is no good. Uh, it's a certain reasonableness that, uh, from adults, you know, one would expect. And, and again, in our environment, that works. Does it work in absolutely every environment? Would it work in a more of a blue collar environment uh, that would be different from a white collar office environment? Hard for me to say. Uh, I can tell you what works for us and, and how it's actually worked out in practice. And in practice, it does work well. And if you saw an employee Xeroxing or printing for his own personal use, would that be something that's unacceptable or would you be okay with that? I would be okay with that. Now, again, you know, are they are they Xeroxing? A, I don't know a copy of uh, uh, who knows. You know, their their home mortgage, which is a few pages. Uh, you know, no no problem. Would they be Xeroxing uh, uh, textbooks for their kids in school that you know that ran hundreds and hundreds of pages? That, that would probably be considered egregious. Uh, but right. I I don't have a problem if you know if somebody's on the internet and you know, needs to, you know, to check on, on their personal email account or if they're using social media uh, or, or things, you know, like that, as long as it doesn't interrupt the work that they need to get done and, and the results and, and them being able to work and collaborate with their team uh, in our environment, those things would be considered uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, uh, again, you know, the, 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 the level of abuse um, or, or people who, who go above and beyond uh, is really a, a very, very small percentage. And, and candidly, if those things occur, generally speaking, those people have other problems as well that manifest themselves. And so um, uh, it, it doesn't happen often. Right. Now, one thing that we've been talking about uh, on this show is that concept of abuse, putting people putting in for reimbursements that are not acceptable, abusive reimbursements. And there's always a, a gray area, what's on the company, what's on the employee, and there are certain gray areas. But have you had people submit for reimbursement things that were clearly, we'll call it suspect, suspect reimbursements or things certainly against the company policy and just trying to slip things through? Uh, I would say, uh, again, it doesn't happen often, but it does, it has happened. Uh, and so I can think of a specific example of one of our field salespeople uh, who submitted several expenses uh, for travel, uh, but it turns out, you know, they didn't actually do that travel uh, and or and or that travel, you know, wasn't for work purposes. And so uh, it was pretty egregious where they said they drove X number of miles when in reality, it you know, couldn't have been anywhere near that number. So it it wasn't even a gray area. Uh, it, it was somebody who was just trying to take advantage of the system. And, and candidly, that person got terminated uh, because that's, you know, that would be considered uh, something for cause. And uh, uh, we were very upfront about that. And there, there was really no surprise associated with it. But, you know, having a, a field sales force of over 100 people, I can tell you in our environment, that doesn't happen often. 
Um, you know, are there areas that could be gray areas? I'm sure there are. Uh, and uh, the expectation would be that, you know, the person would speak to the manager or, or would look for some guidance uh, if, if they needed help making a judgment call. Uh, but uh, egregious uh, violations don't happen often. And when they do, in our environment, they're taken care of, as I, as I would imagine, in, in any environment that would get taken care of. I assume you have an accounting person that reviews uh, reimbursement forms and stuff like that. Absolutely. I mean, we have we have checks and balances in the system, so uh, you know you need to get the requisite sign-offs, the requisite permissions, uh, including me. I mean, I you know I, I submit my expenses and they get reviewed, and and from time to time, you know, they'll ask me about something and say, hey, what what was this and was this a client engagement or, uh, uh, you know, where were you uh, when, when, this, uh, when this receipt came through? And I'd do my best to answer. And if, you know, God forbid there was ever a mistake, I'd, I'd work to rectify it. But, uh, um, you know, nobody, nobody in our environment is, is above that uh, or, uh, you know, trusted without having that, uh, that check and balance. I got to imagine that accounting person is fairly uncomfortable having that conversation. Fair enough, but uh, but I can tell you in our environment it does happen. So um, uh, I'm you know I'm proud of those folks, and I I know that if if they're checking me, then uh, you know they're likely checking other people as well. And I certainly don't begrudge it because that's that's the role that they're in, and that's that's the result that they need to generate. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell me about frequent flyer points. I know this is a big issue at every company. And is there a standard, if you think there's an industry standard, and if uh, what's the company policy? Who keeps those points, the employer or the employee? Yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that there are necessarily industry standards, but there likely are certainly company standards. And I can tell you that in our environment, we've elected to allow individual people to keep uh, their frequent flyer points to be able to ob obtain uh, status on the various airlines that they prefer to fly. Um, and uh, that's a conscious decision that we made. Uh, we could have impl implemented a travel system or a travel program that captures all of that for the benefit of the company. Uh, but we made the, the decision that um, uh, candidly uh, individuals would be so annoyed by that especially those that have to travel quite a bit, that it, it was not worth the cost, uh, frankly, of, of trying to grab all of those back for the benefit of the company. Uh, but for those people that travel a lot for business, if, you know, if they're able to get themselves a, an upgrade based on their status or they're able to board early or, uh, you know, they, they are able to accumulate frequent flyer miles, we're okay with that. Um, but again, that's, that's what I would consider to be a, a personal company policy uh, as opposed to uh, an industry standard, because different companies, I'm sure, have approached things in different ways. Um, that's just a decision that uh, that we've made and, and that works for us. Right. Now, how, how does this work exactly? Each person will have their favorite airline. I fly American Airlines, and they're sure to book on that given airline because they want the frequent flyer points on it. Uh, I mean, that, that's we do have a travel policy, so I don't want to give you the impression that there is no travel policy. We have a uh, a company that helps us book our travel that makes sure that we're keeping our expenses uh, in line. Uh, but there is a certain amount of autonomy that individuals have where they know that they need to get from point A to point B for a business meeting. Uh, and um, uh, they, they have the ability to choose, you know, choose the app, choose the route, choose the airline they'd like to take uh, in order to be able to get there. Uh, and again, it, it's part of being a responsible person that uh, we're expecting that they're not going to, you know, go out of their way or, you know, have to have to have uh, X number of layovers that they otherwise wouldn't have to have uh, just in order to be able to get frequent flyer miles. And, you know, at times there could be judgment calls where somebody says, hey, uh, I want to take a slightly, uh, you know, less expensive flight to be able to, uh, but, but that may stop somewhere rather than a more expensive flight that may get me there nonstop. And, um, you know, I'm going to get mileage on one airline, but not mileage on another airline. So those are those are decisions that we would leave up to the individual and assume that they're being responsible in uh, the choices that they make and, and, and how they go about them. 
Right, interesting. Avi, I just want to uh, conclude with one final question. Not in your industry, but uh, I know you have involvement in various yeshivas and uh, nonprofits. And what have you seen with their adherence to uh, the requirements of um, managing time and expenses and reimbursement? Do you think that they have these same similar policies? I would think that they have the same issues. So how do, how are they handling these things? Yeah, I think that sometimes in the not-for-profit world, uh, some of these issues are um, adhered, I don't want to say adhered to a little less, but but perhaps people are a little bit less sensitive to them. And uh, oftentimes you can have, you know, Clay Kodesh who are responsible for the institutions that they're involved with. And there can be an assumption that, well, you know, the person's a rub or uh, you know, a prominent member of the community, so we don't need to have checks and balances because they're a responsible person. And and my, my view of, of those types of institutions are are that you know it it really ought to be the you know the rub or, or the person who who who, uh, who would be considered clay codish who would be responsible uh, for putting those types of processes in place, having the requisite checks and balances. So that uh, they don't look in any way, uh, so that they could never be a suspicion that they're uh, above the law uh, by, by any means. And so I do think it's important, even in not-for-profit institutions, uh, to have the requisite checks and balances. Make sure that you know whether it's a third party or you know uh, somebody within the organization is 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 uh, is checking off on. On those types of things, uh, and 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 as you know, as we discussed earlier, as it relates to food or time away or or other types of things, each institution is going to have its own set of norms, uh, and and ought to be explicit about what those norms are, so that uh, you know people aren't left wondering or 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 put in a compromised position where you know they think it ought to be one thing and somebody else thinks it ought to be something else. So I think the more transparent we are. Uh, in all of our institutions, whether it be not for profit or or for profit, the better off everybody is uh, in, in being able to uh, adhere to those norms and and uh, not find themselves in gray areas where uh, they're being second guessed. Right, that makes a lot of sense. The worst is the gray areas for both the employee and the employer. So the best is clarity, clear policies, and then there is much more adherence to those policies. I think that's absolutely right. So, you know, I can tell you that one of the values that we have as a company at Edmonds is, is actually called out as transparency. And this would be a great example of that where, uh, you know, we want to be transparent with our employees. We want uh, them to be uh, transparent with us. And uh, the, the more transparency, the easier it is for all of the, the, the people involved uh, to, to be able to figure out how to do what they need to get done uh, uh, without there being gray areas. Right. Avi, thank you so much for joining us. Very interesting. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Good luck. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Joining us now is Harry Rothenberg. Harry is a partner at the Rothenberg Law Firm, which is a nationally prominent Shoma Shabbos firm, which has been representing victims of serious injuries for 50 years. Harry is also a popular speaker and does a popular, very well-known weekly video blog on Parsha and Yantif in conjunction with Orsa Meach. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. So, Harry, we wanted you to join us for a number of reasons. But first, we'd just like to focus on a theme that we've been hearing about on this show, that when it comes to the workplace, there are two possible standards when it comes to what an employee is permitted to use on the job. For example, what can he do with his time or company assets? And the two standards are what's the industry standard, which is an objective standard? What do law firms do? What do accounting firms do in general? And then an even more important standard is a subjective standard. How about the company that I work at? So we'd like to use your firm as a case study, a Manhattan, and actually have a number of offices uh, throughout the East Coast, as a case study as to what would be a normal company policy for you, and I assume that's going to be fairly representative of other law firms and other types of uh, companies in similar industries. So we love input on you. We've We've discussed on this show a, a results-oriented uh, workplace, which is a very flexible workplace, and I'm going to assume as uh, hopefully we'll see shortly, that 
your uh, workplace uh, requirements and policies are going to be somewhat different than that. So if you could give us a case study on uh, the Rothenberg Law Firm and law firms in general probably, what are your policies when it comes to uh, hours, set times, flexibility, vacation days, and the like? Happy to do so. So like most firms, we do have policies. They do differ depending on the type of employee. So for example, a lawyer or a um, or other professional may not have set hours. The lawyers typically do not have set hours in our firm. Um, it is more results-oriented, although we do expect them to handle their caseload, handle the cases that they're assigned, handle everything in conjunction with the case to which they're assigned, and, and track the cases and appear in court and the like. And sometimes they can leave earlier, and sometimes they have to stay late, and sometimes they have to stay very late. Uh, in general, um, the oh, on the other hand, there are employees who have set hours. For example, the receptionist will have a set time of arrival, will have a set time to leave, and will have a set lunch break, uh, and so are many other people in the office. Um, both the people who have flexible hours and the people who have set hours uh, are expected to put in a full work week. Uh, if they miss time, they're expected to make up the time. We understand, for example, that we have from employees and they're going to have to leave early for Shabbos. In fact, we send all of our Jewish employees home in time to make it home for Shabbos, even if they're not observant. Uh, because we don't want to run afoul of any issues with respect to us having had people working for us past the time for which they could have gotten home for Shabbos. Uh, but if somebody is leaving at 2 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, well, then they're going to have to work later on Thursday. I tell this to people all the time when I'm speaking to, to young from people who are entering the workplace that don't think that because you're from, you get to work a four-and-a-half-day work week versus other people who have to work a five-day work week. Well, what do you mean? It's 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 Shabbos. It's Friday. It's in the winter. I have to leave early. Shabbos Shabbos is coming in at, at four o'clock. Of course, you have to leave early, but you got to make up the time. Imagine you. I, I remember way back, way back when, when I first started as a a summer associate in big firm practice, and then as a first year associate, I shared an office, and I had to leave early, uh, particularly as a first year associate in the winter, and I would make it a point of of announcing to my some of the person with whom I shared an office that every Thursday night was going to be a very, very late night because I was going to waltz out early. And so I had to make up that time. Uh, I have a friend... Ha'isim Nekim, Me'ashem Yisrael. You have to make sure to give off the right, right impression. That's right. I have a friend who tells, who, who is a very successful, uh, runs a, a, a business, he's Shemr Shabbos, he said when he interviews from people, he says to them, he, he does this very dramatically, he says to them, by the way, take a look at me, you should just know, I'm not Jewish. And they say, well, what do you mean you're not Jewish? He's wearing a yarmulke. He says, what I mean by that is that I get it that there are going to be times when you have to go to this relative, relative, relative's bris in, in Lakewood from the city, and you're going to be late, you're going to miss a half day. That's fine. I understand that. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to make up that half day. You have to make, But what do you mean I had to go to the bris? I got it. I know you had to go to the bris. That's fine. You're, you're a big boy, big girl. You can go to the, But you have to make up your time. You can't, can't use the, your, your obligations, whether they, are, whether they are halachic obligations like Shabbos and Yontif, or whether they are social obligations like attending a simcha. You can't use that as a shortcut or as an excuse to work fewer hours than someone else who's similarly situated in a, in a similar job. Right, very interesting. So, so uh, this contrasts uh, significantly with a, a, a results-oriented uh, workplace that is fairly free. Work when you want, just deliver your results, and that's it. You don't have to come to the office. You don't have to work any set hours. Uh, you can take off when you want, but just make sure you deliver what you're required to deliver. Um, just m moving on to uh, use of office supplies and time on the job during the day. Are there policies on this, or is it like the honor system? And with respect to, to using supplies, it is an honor system, and it's a functional system. Uh, I don't know that I've ever had to call somebody out on this because I've never seen those types of abuses. I'm not saying that they don't go on. Uh, if you're often working from home, I have some people that work from home, and you need – some supplies for, because you're working at home, whether that's pens or papers or highlighters, etc. Uh, there's no issue with that. Um, if I, of course, were to find somebody coming in with a with a knapsack or a briefcase and stuffing it full of office supplies, a suitcase that, that it was that, right, a suitcase that it was very <laughs> obvious that they were using those for for personal use or for, for themselves, their friends, or their family, uh, then of course that would be that would be over the line. Um, and so there is an expectation that if you're going to use the supplies, it's within reason and it's for, 
for work-related use. Of course, we're not going to keep track that if somebody decides to to bring their bring pens home, um, that's a different story. Now, when it comes to the an area of severe abuse or potential abuse, have you seen people trying to put in expenses for reimbursement that are, we'll, we'll say, suspect? So I have to be careful answering that question. I don't know which of my employees will be answering that. So I will say this. Uh, I have seen uh, now, since I joined the firm in December of 1996, it's been many, many, many years. It's been decades now. So if I haven't seen everything, I've seen close to everything. Uh, so let's go with the let's go from the the, uh, the question marks to the to the clear no nos. The question marks are somebody goes and uses their car for something that's work related. It just makes more sense. They have to go to a court appearance in a in a far flung jurisdiction, further than let's say the ones that we could reach, let's say in our Manhattan office where somebody would take the subway to one of the to one of the local counties. They have to go up to to Dutchess County, to Putnam County, to Sullivan County, somewhere where it makes sense that they're going to use their car. And of course we're going to reimburse them. We're going to reimburse them for gas, we're going to reimburse them for tolls, uh, and the like. The question though that comes up, particularly with employees that will often use their car, is does that mean we reimburse for a car wash? Does that mean that we reimburse for a wheel alignment? Does that mean that we reimburse for other sorts of, of regular maintenance? And that's sort of you know one that, that's employee by employee and case by case and one that we have to talk through. And yes, I have certainly have seen things where I'll say, mm, I don't know about that one, and we'll talk it through. Maybe I'll say, you know what, I'll reimburse you for half of that. Those are the question mark ones. Then there are the ones that are clearly over the line where, yes, I have in very, very rare occasions, unfortunately, uh, seen and, and, and found the submission of false expense reports. Uh, it's grounds for immediate termination. It's, it's no different than putting your hand into the, into the money jar, you know, stealing from the firm's bank account. Um, that, that's, a, that's a cause for immediate dismissal. And I don't think that's something that I need to warn people or explain to people. If you are caught submitting false expense reports, uh, it's grounds for termination. And you've had that situation? Unfortunately. Very rarely, but unfortunately. Okay. So, Harry, I want to broaden the conversation now. You come into contact with numerous people throughout the East Coast, probably beyond observant, not observant, non-Jewish. Where have you seen areas where Kalal Yisrael can improve when it comes to integrity, honesty, in particular in, in the workplace and their business dealings? So that question uh, has a lot of resonance because, as you said, I do come across a lot of people in a lot of situations. Uh, unfortunately, my my sixth sense or my my spidey sense will often start tingling uh, when I see something that is an obvious problem. So what would be the, the classic case? I have to be careful here. Of, I'm, of course, not talking about any specific client, uh, but just in general. If I see in an initial case it's a serious accident and the person calling me is in their 20s and they live in let's say I'm I'm going to I'm going to choose these not at not at total random just because it's something that that happens often is they're in their 20s and they're married and they live in Lakewood or they're in their 30s and they're married and they live in Lakewood and yet the car is registered to a parent or to an in-law who's living in Brooklyn now I get it somebody just got married now the the father or the schwer gives them a car to use and they've been married a week they've been married 3 weeks They've been married a month. It's a time of transition. Mir Tashem, this Sunday, my daughter's getting married. Uh, and so I understand that. Very, very busy time. And you didn't realize, oh, you know, when I gave them that car, I really should have told the insurance company that they're using that car and garaging that car many miles away. It's not in Brooklyn. And it's being driven now, unlike by somebody who's, let's say, in their 50s, it's now being driven by somebody in their 20s. That will change the rates. Somebody in their 20s driving a car will typically be charged, especially in their early 20s, somebody who's a less experienced driver, will be charged more by an insurance company than somebody who's driving in their 50s who's a much more experienced driver who has less of a – especially if there's no claims history. And there may be a, a difference in New Jersey rates versus New York rates. So if it's a, a week, it's a, it's a month, it's two months, understandable, when it's three years, when it's five years, when it's seven years later, and somebody's continuing to do that, I hate to say it. But it wouldn't be a stretch to say that that may be insurance fraud. I'm not poskening, but I'm pointing out that when there's a serious accident and when an insurance company starts ans asking questions, which they often do, and you see that somebody who's obviously from was playing games, it's a black eye for the Jewish people. That's, that's, that's one example that's, that's, a, that's a constant one um, that happens, that happens I, I can't say it happens in every case, but it happens often. I see it, I see it uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a very frequent basis. Um, then you've got 
other things that go on. Again, I'm not singling anybody out, but these are the types of things that people don't realize. They won't see the light of day until there's an accident, and then it does, and it doesn't look good because insurance adjusters are sophisticated. Defense attorneys are very sophisticated, and you'll see somebody who will come out who, for example, let's say is working, and based on the type of job they're doing, maybe they and their spouse combined are making enough money that they shouldn't qualify for governmental benefits, and yet they're on governmental benefits. Why? Because they're being paid off the books or they're being paid partly off the books or mostly off the books. Or you have something that's even more obvious when somebody is injured very seriously, and yet we're not making a lost wage claim even though they cannot go back to work or have not been able to go back to work, sometimes can never go back to work. Well, why aren't we making a lost wage claim? The person must have been making $50,000 a year, whatever the number is. Why isn't the lawyer making a lost wage claim? Hmm, I wonder. Must be because the person was being paid off the books. If they're being paid off the books, it creates a, a problem. It doesn't. It's not an insurmountable problem. There are instances when we are able to bring the lost wage claim. But imagine the situation when you have somebody who's who's quite clearly from and quite clearly being paid off the books, and and it's it's a problem. It's another it's another black eye that comes out often in embarrassing fashion. It can be a chalashem when it comes out during a case because people don't realize. Well, how's anybody ever going to know? Well, if there's an accident, then people may know. And then there are the ones that are um, that, that keep me up at night because they're so horrifying. And here I can talk with, with some more specificity because we're talking about defendants. We're not talking about my clients. We're talking about the people that we're going after. Uh, at any point in time, I, have, I can think of uh, a few offhand right now. I have situations going on where we are battling insurance companies because the insurance companies are trying to rescind the policy for the defendant, which means that my client got hurt very badly. Those are the types of cases that we get involved in, often mind-numbingly badly, horrifying types of injuries that no one should ever know from. And the insurance company writes us a letter saying, we are taking away the policy, we are, we are going to be filing an action to rescind the policy because we discovered that the defendant committed fraud. And often the defendant is not from, not, not, not a yid, not something that's going to create a, uh, if it's not a yid, it's not a chel Hashem issue, but often the person's a yid and often the person's from. And what did they do? Well, so what are common examples? They rented a van, and they told Geico or Flo after watching the commercials, and they got their insurance that they had a van, and it's being garaged at such and such an address, and it's being used by them and by their spouse. What they didn't tell the insurance company is that they were running a business. What's the business? They're transporting children back and forth to camp. They're transporting children back and forth, students, to school. So that's now a van for hire. And when the insurance company priced that policy, they thought that husband and wife were going to use the van occasionally. They would drive to work. They'd drive back from work. So they'd use it a few times a day. They'd do some errands. Occasionally, they'd go on a family trip. They didn't know that that van was going to have four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen students in it driving back and forth. They didn't know that the person was going to go hire a driver so now there's someone else driving the vehicle. They have no idea who that is. Now you tell me, had the insurance company known that, would they, would they have charged more for the policy? Of course they no would. No question. They would have said it's no a question. commercial policy. We're taking on far more risk. If there's an accident, many more people can get injured. And now when that happens, they move to rescind the policy. And the defendant will often say, I didn't realize, I didn't know. Give me a break that you didn't realize and you didn't know that when you're running a business with many more people in it that you didn't have to tell your insurance company what you're using that car for. Or, similar example, we'll have a, so we have a situation going on now. We're in a, a uh, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on this one, uh, to respect the, 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 the family, to keep it anonymous, but let's put it this way. There, there's an action going on now to rescind the policy because the defendant, again, a very obviously from company with a from driver, uh, they did not tell the insurance company what they were going to be using the van for. And so this was different. It wasn't that it was a, a van for hire, but it was something that they thought was going to be used only internally in the company, not out in the, in the public in a manner in which it could uh, – there was the potential for far more harm. And, it's, uh, and it's, it's not only – so there, it's not just that there's a chil Hashem, which is more than enough of a reason not to do something like this. In these types of situations, what you're faced with is my client's who've been grievously injured, grievously injured. I have people who have lost name a limb, lost arms, lost legs, lost eyesight, lost the ability to think, eat, sleep, walk. People, I have represented people who have lost 
grandparents, mothers, fathers, spouses, brothers, sisters, and in the worst cases, sons, daughters, and there's no coverage. They not only it's, it's all the, because of it's because of all the shtick that was played. Because somebody right, because somebody decided to play games to save a few dollars. And it's not now. I'm not. It's not for me to judge. I'm not the judge. There's a judge upstairs. But it is for me to educate people to to make sure that they realize that if you play games and there's a problem and there's an accident and this happens, you could be creating a massive chol and you could be you could you could leave yourself or others or your loved ones absent the the covers that they would otherwise have uh, via right, insurance. Right. Right now, now, Harry, to go in a somewhat different direction or the opposite direction to what we've been discussing, have you seen examples out there on on the job of Kiddush Hashem? Of course, um, not just not just Kiddush Hashem, but Kiddush Hashem in 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 ways that are that are uh, incredibly satisfying and incredibly inspiring. Um, so, to two that come to mind that I've seen many times are most poskim uh, will tell you. That that the many of my cases are okay because there and there's no problem with the din of our cause as follows. If That's secular court. In, in, Going to yeah, secular court. I'll, I'll explain. Which is that if I've got a Jewish client who's bringing an action against a Jewish defendant, they can't use secular courts to seek money. A Jew can't use a secular court, can't file a lawsuit in a secular court to try to take money from another Jew. You have to go to Beisdin. So how how can I have cases? That are make up names, generic names. Goldberg versus Schwartz, or 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 or, or Cohen versus Rosenberg. How can you have that? And the answer is that most postcom will tell you that as long as there's insurance involved, the lawsuit is directed in name only against the defendant. But in actuality, the person, the entity from whom we're taking the funds, is an insurance company, and so that's fine. Speak to your local Orthodox rabbi, but that is, that is overwhelmingly the general consensus. However, in a minority of cases, the din of our cause shows up in a very big way, the din of not being able to use secular courts to extract money from a fellow Jew. How does that happen? What if there's a case where there's no insurance? What if there's a case where there's a gap in insurance? What if there's a case like in the ones I've explained where the insurance gets gets rescinded and now the person's left with no insurance? And so you could have a situation with somebody who's terribly injured. You could have a very wealthy yid on the other side, and we have to ask a shayla now. And so I will say to my client, you have a choice. We can either ask my rav. I explain that my rav, I have him on speed dial. He has the, he's the firm's posek, uh, Rabbi Yosef Viner. I have no doubt that he has answered more personal injury-related questions than any rav anywhere. I have no question of that by now because that's how often we've had to post questions to him. And sometimes the answer – these are very complicated cases often. And sometimes the answer is you can go ahead. And other times the answer is you can't go ahead. Or I'll tell the client, you can you can ask for a psaac from your Rav. I'm happy to go with you, and I've done that before. Sometimes people have said, are you okay? Can we go to my Rav? And sometimes we'll do it over the phone. Sometimes I'll go to speak to that Rav, to that Rosh Hashiva, to that Rosh Kolo. And sometimes the answer is no, and I have clients that, like my firm, walk away from what would be very substantial recoveries. Because that's what the halacha says. That's it. Mm. It's the end of the day. That's what the halacha says. And I've had some some even go further uh, and say, lifni mishur sedin. I'm going to walk away, even though, even though I don't have to. To the extent that I had once in a stunning case, wherein someone asked me to come speak to the Rosh Kolo, and I did, and they, they and it was, and it was, it involved a very serious uh, accident involving a child, and there was a yid on the other side, and that the, so the, the Rosh Kolo asked me many, many questions, fantastic questions. Um, I was wondering at one point maybe he, maybe he had gone to law school and didn't tell anybody. That's how excellent the questions were, not surprisingly. <laughs> And at the end, he said to this Kolo Jungerman and his wife in front of me, he said, you asked me for my opinion, so I'm, going to, I'm not going to tell you that it's mutter to go forward because I know what's going to happen. If I tell you that it's mutter to go forward, you're not going to go forward because I, I can tell from your questions that you feel with Nima Shur said then you, you shouldn't. So I'm going to tell you instead it's also for you not to go forward. You have to go forward because you don't have the right to not bring this case with Nima Shur Sadin because it's your son who was injured and he's a baby and he needs the care that Mr. Rothenberg can get for him. And so we went forward. And the clients, there's no question the potential clients would not have if not for the Rosh Kalal's uh, intervention. And we later sell the case several years later for many, many, many millions of dollars. And and Leanne and Hara were able to greatly improve the the very impaired life of that um, of that young child. Uh, and similarly, I've seen seen people in these in these gut wrenching cases, cases that that uh, that Edgar Allan Poe would say, oh, that's 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 horrifying even for me. 
and they keep their faith. They keep their amuna in the face of of, of mind-boggling um, darkness, and they're able to find light in the middle of, of despair, recognizing mm-hmm. that Hashem loves them, and it's a, and it's a decree from from Shemayim, and they have to accept it, and it's very inspirational. Harry, just uh, one final departing question for you: Do you have some words of chizuk for Klal Yisrael to improve in these areas of honesty and integrity? Uh, I do. Uh, I saw a very beautiful piece from Rabbi Yashiv, um not long ago uh, in Parsha's Bahar. I, I turned this into a into a video when we got to that to Parsha as follows, and, I, and it, it says tremendous resonance for me, and I hope it will also for people listening. Uh, he points out that in that Parsha, uh, Hashem is telling um, Klai Yisrael that you're going to go into the land, you're going to go into Eretz Yisrael, and you're going to, for six years, you're going to plant, you're going to eat till you're satisfied, and then on the seventh year, you let the land lay fallow. And if you'll say, well, what are we going to eat during the seventh year? Don't worry. In the sixth year, I'm going to give you a triple blessing. You'll have enough for the sixth, seventh, and eighth year. Rav Yasha points out that when Hashem is pointing out that when you go into the land, you're going to eat and be satisfied, that's not a prediction of what's going to happen. That's a tzavah, it's a command. Hashem is saying, for the first six years, eat until you're satisfied. Because I'll know the difference. If you start swirling away food, you start creating a reservoir, putting food into a, into a silo or a barn, because you don't trust me to give you that triple blessing in the sixth year, then guess what? You don't get that bracha. If you show me that you don't trust me, that you want to rely on yourself, then that's great. Rely on yourself. You're taking me out of the equation. I am only going to give the open nace of a threefold blessing from one crop to people who believe in me. So you've got to show me that you believe in me. So it has such, such incredible resonance for me is that you could be davening and davening and davening with all sorts of genuine kavana, pouring your heart, Hashem, give me all those blessings. And the same bracha, adding in your, your individual tefillahs for your individual cases or, or, or deals or your job or seeking promotions, etc. But if at the same time you're playing games, cheating on your taxes, the types of games that I talked about, whatever in every business, there are all sorts of games you can play and lines that you can cross. You're showing Hashem that you're not really trusting Him. You're relying on yourself. Because if you really trusted Him, why are you playing games? Again, I'm not poskening for anybody. There are all sorts of complicated questions you have to ask your Rav. But everybody knows, you know, deep down, if they're honest with themselves, they know when they're breaking the law. They know when they're doing things that are fraudulent. They know when they're doing things that are non-halachic. And like I always say when people say to me, you know, it's okay to cheat on your taxes. I say, well, who says that? And they say, well, it's, and they always tell me the same Rav's name. It's always the same Rav. I wish I could ever meet this Rav. The Rav is my friend's Rav. That's who says it. I wish I could meet that guy. There's some guy out there named my friend's Rav who says that it's okay to cheat on your taxes. Or so Vayashev saying, if you do that, you're telling Hashem that I don't trust you. So if you don't trust Hashem... You know, good luck when it, when uh, when it comes time to to ask him for what you need. So wow. words to, to I think to live by, especially with Rosh Hashanah coming up around the corner. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me thank on. Thank you. Hatzlacha. Thanks so much. Be well. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Joining us now is Judge Ruchi Fryer. Judge Fryer needs no introduction. She is literally a Jewish celebrity, being the famous Hasidic judge from Borough Park. She is also the founder of Ezra Snashim Emergency Medical Services. Judge Fryer, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Judge Fryer, a pleasure to have you here. This is a show about integrity in the workplace, but I don't want to lose the opportunity to have a broader conversation with you. So we'll Amir Chashem get back at the end of the conversation to Hoshan Mishpat and workplace integrity, but I wanted to start with a question that's really on my mind. You went a couple decades ago from being a secretary to a paralegal to an attorney, Malim Bakodesh Vemoridim to a judge and to also founding Ezra Snashim. So where does all of your motivation and where does all your energy come from? Well, um, first of all, I was really very lucky, and they had incredible Siakta Deshmaya helping me and you know, encouraging me and giving me the opportunity. But really, I have to say that I have wonderful parents who always have been motivating me, encouraging me to keep on trying and keep on doing more. And like it says in Pirkeyevos, Hayom Katser Vamacha Meruba, there's just so many opportunities out there, and I just try to seize as many as I can. 
Mm-hmm. Wow, that's what, it's w- one thing to the next to the next. I mean, that's that's quite uh, increases in uh, in career and changing. I mean, that's uh, that takes a lot of motivation. Well, Baruch Hashem, I had the opportunity, and um, I'm really grateful to Hakadosh Baruch Hu that I had these opportunities. Uh, terrific. Okay, so let's get to the workplace. So many workplace issues result from our, at least what I've seen, is not wanting to be different. We don't want to stick out. I think that's human nature. And a result of that, we see that, unfortunately, people dress more casually in the workplace so they don't stick out. And we see some men take off the yarmulkes and uh, some people attend events that they shouldn't be attending Mm -hmm. and we get involved in activities we shouldn't be involved in. But you, on the other hand, seem to not be overly concerned about being and looking different. Has that always been the case with you? So I think it has, and I think it has simply because I I started college as an older student. I was 30 when I decided to finally go to college because until then there were no college opportunities really for the for the from women, and I was a bit nervous because I had naysayers all along that it wasn't going to be possible and that I would go down in my level of from kite. And what I tried to do was prepare myself when I was going to start going to college and going for higher education. There weren't books like you're writing now or like you wrote by Wasserman, but there were books out there that I tried to like glean different parts and, and pieces from the books and how to protect myself as I'm going on to higher education. And I read that if you really want to protect yourself, let people know who you are and say it up front and be um don't be bashful about it. And I learned that by not shaking hands when I meet people and by saying, Please forgive me, I'm Hasidic and I won't shake hands with you that not only did I not have to be embarrassed, I realized that I should be proud of it because being proud of who we are just makes that impression so much more powerful. And there's a real interest in the outside world and diversity. So if you're open and you're honest, what I learned is not only does it not hold you back, but that's really what propelled me to be able to advance and go from one level to the other level. So when you come to my chambers, you'll see I have pictures of myself with my husband and my kids and with their, their bar mitzvah with the Bieber hat, like the felt hats, and my husband with the shrimal, and I'm and I'm very proud of it. And I think that by showing that I don't mind being different, I think I was able to advance, and it, it's, it's counterintuitive, but instead of working against me, it worked in favor of me. Uh-huh. Do you think that would be applicable for all Orthodox Jews out there, or is there something unique I, to your situation? No, I really think so. I really think, I really think, it's, I think that is the way people should, um, should carry themselves. You know, I'll give you a little example. When I was a legal secretary in one of the large law firms in Manhattan, I was introduced to the concept of Dress Down Friday. I don't know if your listeners know what that is. but Casual lo- day, casual Friday. Yeah, in the large corporate world, they want to make the workers feel that they're not working so hard on Fridays in the summertime so you can dress down. There were some rules, but by and large, it's dress down. Now, I'm from Bar Park. We like to dress up. Every Friday, I had like this issue and di- dilemma. What am I going to wear today? So one Friday, I had this dress that I knew it, was, it had borderline sleeves. But I figured I'm going to work in the city, uptown Manhattan. Who really cares about my sleeves? But I want you to know that one of the attorneys that I was assigned to work for, one of the associates, who was Jewish but not observant, not religious, comes over to my desk. And he puts his hand over his eyes and says to me, Rachel, I see your forearms. And, and I want you to know that none of my Tzniah's teachers in Beis Yaakov ever impacted me like that young attorney did. Because his message to me was, I know you're religious, and I know you're supposed to dress modestly, and I'm sure that you don't know that your sleeves are too short. Because that message to me was, when we show the world that we have standards, the world wants us to keep those standards. Even if they don't live by it, they want to know that there are people that do. So we we have to really be proud of of who we are and and not feel that we have to make excuses or blend in. I didn't mind standing out, and it worked to my advantage at the end of the day. Well, that's a very powerful story. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I remember it like it was just yesterday. And by the way, when I came home from work that day, I promptly threw out that dress. 
<laughs> but, so you mentioned before that you didn't have books, you didn't have proper preparation when you were going out into the workplace. What were a, one, two, a few of the things that you would have wanted to know when uh, entering the workplace? Um, so what I would have wanted to know was that that even though sometimes you think something is difficult at the onset, at, you know, in the long run, you're going to see that it's going to be gamzo tova. You're going to see that sometimes you have to go through these bumps, but it's it's going to work itself out. And, you know, in law school, we were taught that um, you don't have to know the answers. You have to spot the issues. We were graded for issue spotting. And when you're going out into the workforce and you, you feel that something's not right, you sense it's not right, spot those issues early on and asay l'charav, have a rub that you can ask these questions to. Because you know what? They taught us in law school, the only question that's a bad question is the one you don't ask. So being being prepared to know that I'm going to have Shilas and that I'm going to ask them and I'll get answers would have really alleviated a lot of stress. That, oh, no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So we have to be prepared to see what the potential issues are and when they come up to ask our Shaila. So I'll put you on the spot here. Give us uh, some examples of questions that you have asked your Rav or Posik that you've encountered. So I have asked um, when I we have an event that's in a, a non-Jewish environment and it's a non-kosher restaurant, whether or not I'm allowed to go. And depending on all the facts and circumstances, sometimes I'm told, yes, you can go. Just make sure that the food that you're eating is very obviously kosher and not part of what everybody else is eating. Or if I get invited to go speak to different communities, which may be not on the same level of uh, observance as I am, whether it's outside the Orthodox community, if it's in the Reform or Conservative community, I, I believe that on a certain level, but another level is, am I allowed to go speak in a non-religious, you know, sanctuary? These are real shilas that I had to ask. Or, or what if I have a worker and I'm asked to sign off on that worker's time, and I see that that worker is like leaving early or coming late. Now, it's one thing if I want to be nice and generous, but this is being billed to the state. So these are questions that I have to ask. And um, once I know that I have someone to ask, it just takes a whole load of stress off my mind. I say lecharaf, and you get a psak, and then you act accordingly. Correct. Got it. Now, th- that has to do with specific shilas that comes up in the workplace, but how about have you felt that there is a conflict a conflict between your Torah values and the secular values that you have encountered and continue encountering? No, I don't, because I think Torah values, they, they trump all, and they, they reign supreme. And every time I have a question, I always say, like, wow, it's so incredible that we have – the Torah, we have halacha, we have that guiding us. I mean, you, all you have to do is open up a newspaper and see um, all the issues that come up in the outside world. And I sometimes wonder, like, how in the world can the outside world know what's inappropriate conduct if they're never taught what is appropriate conduct? Ah, so give me an example of something like that of what would be inappropriate versus appropriate conduct? Yeah, and what where, where have you felt that uh, that rub there? So I can just give you, I mean, going to a simple example, let's assume we have the the halacha of, of yichud. So I'd, be go, I'd go into a meeting, and then the attorney would go and close the door. Now, I could, you know, I could feel uncomfortable if I want to, or I could just say, please forgive me, but the door can't be locked, um, it can't be closed if it's locked on the other side. And then I would see how ultimately this person will turn to me and say, you know something, it's, it's such a pleasure working with you because there's this thick black line between us, and I know I will never go over that line. So time and time again, I'll find that the halachas that were implemented were there for our protection. So, and, and as long as we can explain, see, I think what's important really is consistency. You can't you can't cut corners in certain halachos and then be and then be machmir in something else. So, if a person is going to be consistent and stick to 
what his values are or what her values are, the people that you're working with will get it and they'll respect it. I don't know if I answered your question, so right, let me know right. if you have another question or if I missed a point. Yeah, if, uh, give me an example maybe in, in studying in law school or something like that. Uh, they, they teach uh, things that aren't exactly uh, Torah values. Um, yeah, so I mean, so I mean, this happens all the time where you learn something and um, you're studying something and it may go against Torah values. So to a certain extent, um, I can't talk about certain cases because it, it make if I say certain case if I if I talk about certain topics which may give someone an idea of how I'll rule on a case, I can't necessarily speak about the case. But in general, when we were studying constitutional law, there were certain issues that were discussed. Um, and I would always raise my hand, raise my hand, and I and I thought it was I thought it was such a fascinating subject because so many so many issues that the framers of the Constitution and our founding fathers had based this country on are so similar to Torah values. So I remember we were once talking about some constitutional issue relating to women's rights, and I raised my hand and I said how I felt, and the class was up in arms. They will say, well, who are you to say? How do you know how it feels? Whatever you had your children, you, you, you always were in a warm family environment. How can you make such a decision? How could you make such a statement? And well, I said, look here, all I can say is that every time I gave birth, it was just a beautiful experience. And I'm just talking from my own experience. And then the professor just loved the fact that every time I would speak, it would cause a whole commotion in class because that's what studying law is all about. It's about debate and being argumentative. And then he stopped one of the girls in the class who, was, who wasn't Jewish, and she, he asked her, like, how do you feel? And she said, well, Rachel's right. So sometimes mm-hmm. if you stand off for what you believe in, people actually stop and say, hey, you know what? She's right, or he's right. Hmm. That's interesting. Do, do, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're quite unique from where you come from. Do you have a role model maybe that you look up to for how you act in the workplace? So actually, it's an interesting question because I have a female role model and I have a role model who's from the from the male segment of our population. So one of my professors in Brooklyn Law School was Professor Tversky, and it was it was actually for me very comforting when I went to, when I started law school because again that was a whole new environment for me, an academic liberal environment, and walking down the corridor and seeing a professor with a long black coat and the beaver hit and the long beard was was for me very, very heartwarming and gave me a lot of chizuk. But the fact that Professor Tversky was so, and still is, so highly regarded and respected is an incredible Kiddush Hashem. One of my classmates, and by the way, it was very hard getting into his classes, one of my classmates asked me, a non-Jewish girl says, she says, Rachel, are all Jewish men like Professor Tversky? Because if they are, I'll convert. Mm, wow. <laughs> See, that's, this is Professor Aaron Tversky. Yes, yes, and he's yeah. he's on the restatement, and he's he's so respected, and he doesn't compromise the standards. And then from the from the role models from uh, the women in, in in history, I look to Sarah Schneera. Sarah Schneera was a a revolutionary figure in a very quiet, modest way. She believed that that Jewish daughters need an, a Jewish education, and even though she went against the tide and she had so much opposition, she knew what was right, and she just stood up for it in a in a very, very dignified way. And um, I read a book about her life story, which really it 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 just boggled me. And I said, "This is the book that I needed to read," and it, it was it was written by one of her Talmidos. Pearl Benish, and it was called Carry Me in Your Heart. And in there, she tells her, tell me, Dulce, a profound lesson. She says, a Jewish daughter has to always wear a dress with two pockets. And in one pocket, you carry the pasuk, your modesty is your badge of pride. You carry it in your heart with your head up high because that's what identifies you as a Jewish daughter. But in your other pocket, you carry the pasuk, there comes a time when you have to be a leader and stand up for what's right because people 
are trampling Torah values. And she says, girls, you will be leaders and people will follow you. And she trained young single girls during those years before you had telephones and travel was much harder back then to these far-flung shtetls to become teachers and open up these Yaakovs in these little shtetls. And she mm-hmm. changed Kali Stroll's history. So those are my two role models. Very interesting. Um, you speak a lot about sticking with our values, the need to stick with our values. Uh, I want to drill down on that a little bit and, and discuss what specific values are you referring to? I think all of our values, but more importantly, uh, I think the challenge comes in terms of tzniyas, in terms of, of family values. And we need to know that when there's no flexibility, there is no flexibility, and, and there shouldn't be. Sometimes you're going to find that you may be in an environment where people are not so accommodating and they're difficult to work with. My own experience has been that sometimes we have to pick up and go. Sometimes if we feel the siva is really not right, you just say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, your world is big enough. And if this is not the right place for me, if, if this place is pushing me to compromise my values, Hashem, find me the right place. And that has happened to me more than once. In fact, I want you to know, and your listeners should know, that sometimes the challenge can come out of left field from places where you haven't even imagined it would come. In my experience working out in the world more than 30 years, I've had the biggest nisjonos when I worked in the more firmer offices. When I was the only from person in the firm and I said this is not allowed, I, whatever I said was completely, completely respected. And when I would work with people who were maybe just from the same level as I am, I would get comments like, why are you so machmer? That's not the halacha. This one doesn't hold that way. That one doesn't hold that way. So we have to always be very cognizant that sometimes in the places where we think we can be more at ease and let our guard down, it's just the opposite. Right, and I've heard that from another number of places, number of people discussing the challenges of being in the Hamish um, Haredi from our workplaces relative to secular. Then in the secular workplace, you have a little bit more distance from others. It's clear you're different from everyone else, so they respect that and they give you that space, which may not be the case when it comes to working in a, a from environment. Mm-hmm. There are other challenges. There are challenges, different challenges in each of them. Correct. That is correct. But, you know, with, with each challenge comes growth. And that's that's one of the things that I, I would, would like to share with other people. Had I known years ago that no matter what, you're not going to avoid them. They're going to be there. This is just the way Hashem runs the world. But just like there's a challenge, there's a solution. There's a way to deal with it. And sometimes we struggle. We have to really struggle until we find our, our level of comfort. But but having a rough to consult with and, and having the sources and the books and the farm to read is a tremendous help. And it's it's wonderful what you're what you're doing for the public and even even this show itself. I, I do have very frequently people who send me emails and I have very often young women who come to meet with me to ask me all these questions that are going through their mind. And um I think we have tremendous opportunities I mean, my grandmother back in the Heim in Hungary didn't have the opportunities that I have today. So I think while we have the opportunities, they come with their challenges, but they can be dealt with. Right, absolutely. So I just want to move over to talk about Chosh and Mishpat challenges. So as a judge in the New York City Civil Court, you see a lot. I mean, you see a lot of conflict, a lot of financial disputes that you have to make decisions over. And I'd love to hear what can we learn from what you have seen when people are having these controversies? What can Klali show learn from them? Okay. So I think what I used to explain to my clients when I was in private practice was that everything should be in writing. Because even if you get along so well with people right now, you have to put it in writing and that this will maintain your friendship. And nothing should be too difficult to write. Even these 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 um, concepts that may be hard to talk about should be in writing. And I used to insist that when I had two from, you know, a contract between two from people, that we would, we put in the writer itself that in the event of a dispute, it goes goes through a din Torah, and either we choose 
which Rabbanim, if we choose a panel of Rabbanim, or we choose a based in, but we address this issue. And I would say 90% of the time it was agreed upon. Maybe 10% the other side said, no, we're not going to agree to this. But most of the time they did. And this way you can avoid, you can avoid so much trouble because once someone is in a dispute, it gets too complicated to decide then where we're going to go for arbitration. Yeah, so have it in writing, in the mm-hmm. writing, in the contract, decide which base team, because I guess it's a little bit difficult when you're in the dispute already to have that discussion. That is correct, absolutely. And, and I do have to let everybody know that in no way am I holding myself out as somebody who is well-versed in Hoshe Mishpat. I, I have to just make that very clear. Yeah, I have to know my, what my limitations are. We're getting chizuk from you. That's what we're focused on. We're not asking okay. a halachic shailas. Um, another question. When people get in a dispute, should they look at it as, and should they be looked at by others as doing something wrong if they go to Bastin, or is this just a proper way people get in disputes, there are disagreements, there are misunderstandings, and, and go settle it properly? Right. You know, as someone once told me, you know, People make mistakes, and that's why pencils have erasers. I've learned how important it is to be done with Kafskos because we really don't know what someone could be going through when they make a bad decision. And I was recently myself the victim of people who thought that I made a bad decision, and they had no way of knowing all the other information that wasn't public knowledge that went into my decision. And I knew that I made the best decision possible. And it was months later when I reviewed the record when I saw, yep, I made the right decision. And I thought to myself, you know, Kav Yachla Kaddish Baruch Hu is a judge of all judge, king of all kings. And sometimes we say, like, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And I've learned the, the incredible Moser Haskell from myself that we don't always know everything. We can't see everything. So to be down like Havskos is really very important. So when you see uh, an outwardly Orthodox Jew who committed a financial crime, Don Lakovskos, maybe he just made a I, mistake. I, 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 well, I wouldn't say that we have that it should be condoned, and I wouldn't say that it should be encouraged. Chas v'shalom. But if somebody is already in that matzav, we don't know. We really don't know all the different things that went on, but what we could learn is what to be careful of and what to try to avoid. Right. Uh, my, my my father used to tell me when teaching me how to drive, you can learn something from everybody. From some people, you learn what to do, and from some people, you learn what not to do. Mm-hmm. That is correct. That is correct. And and I, I've also learned the importance of speaking up. It's so important to speak up for what's right. Many people um, don't do that. They say, I'll just be quiet. So I guess it depends really on what where a person is and what opportunities they have. But the the important the, the important concept of standing up for what's right is something that means a lot to many people. And if you're outwardly from and you're in an environment um, and you have the chance to speak out and and portray what true Torah values are, I think that's an opportunity. Uh, just in closing, one last question. What would you say is the most important message that you have from some, for somebody who is about to enter or in the workplace already? Okay. So my absolute message is that we're all different. Hashem created us all very differently, and we were, even in terms of, of our background, we have Sephardim, we have Ashkenazim, we have Hasidim, we have um, Misnagdim. Hashem created us completely different. So we have different standards. But whatever your standards are, don't think for one second that you have to compromise them to succeed in the outside world, whether it's the corporate world, whether it's the legal world or the medical world, whatever world you find yourself in, because you don't. And in fact, it's just the opposite. If you stick to your values and you let the world know that you're proud of your values, it'll be just the opposite. You will see that it will help you succeed. It will not hold you back. Judge Fryer, it has been such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Has Slacharaba continue in all your great work. I mean, thank you so much. Before we go to the winner of the week, we would just like to replay the riddle David asked from last week. So it says, Hashem. 
right? That din of, the din of Havas Bikurim, and the, the Mishnah says in Bikurim Perigimel, Kol Bali Umni Yeshebiru Shalayim Oimdim Lefneim, when people used to come from far away, far away, they would travel for, for weeks to bring their Bikurim, there was no cars, there were no highways, there were no trains, so they would stand up in respect the shayalim b'shloimam, the respect of the, the you know the uh, the the oyle regel, the sojourner, and the rab says, mishum de chaviva mitzvah b'shaita, they would stand up not just for the effort, but the chaviva mitzvah b'shaita, and then the rab continues, umitamze oimdim ipnei noisi hamita shamespa, we have here a precedent, chaviva mitzvah b'shaita, stand up in front of the the mace. Right, the mitzvah of Ayas Hamais, whom we play noise hatina ikla brismila, and we stand up for the kvata who's bringing him for the brismila. Say, Baruch Haba, everybody stands up, that's this uh, Rav. Chayre, it's a pelem, it's under the Chala Yeshiva Bachram, right? The Havos Bikurim, there's a mitzvah of Havo to bring it. Actual bringing is a mitzvah. That is, say, over a Yeshiva Bachra, one says to Chazenish. Is it a mitzvah hava, or is it a mitzvah stam to bring in? So the chaz, as a mitzvah bring in, so the chazanish looked at him and he said, "It's a marvel you only speak two languages." The bottom line is, there's a mitzvah hava spikurim. So you stand up, chaviv a mitzvah. There's a mitzvah of levoyas hames, but to bring the tinnik to the to the to the moil. I mean, the moil could go to the tinnik too. That's just that's not a mitzvah. Some type of a hechsher, it's a, but it's certainly not a mitzvah. So how could he stole to havas bikurim, which havas is a mitzvah, levayas ames to to bring to tinaik? I want to ask you something. There's a mitzvah to eat on Shabbos, oyneg Shabbos. Would you stand up to somebody in the supermarket who's shopping for Shabbos? He would say, "Look, that's not the mitzvah. You need that to make oyneg Shabbos. Bringing the tinaik to the mile is." It's just, I don't even know, it's maybe a Hech Mitzvah, right? It's certainly not a Mitzvah. It's like shopping for Shabbos, right? But let's go back to our question. Why do we stand up for the Rach Hanimo, which is brought already in the uh, in the Paiskim? Hi. First of all, Grace uh, Yashikoyach for this podcast. I really, really enjoy it. I wanted to answer the riddle of the week. I saw a grot in a sefer called Kima Vihider from Rav Yitzhak Leo Shtazman. He writes that um, he brings the same question and he answers it in the name of Zecher David, Sefer Zecher David from Reb David's Chus that actually bringing the child to the bris mila, holding him and bringing him is compared in the Kadmainim they compare it to to, to, to to bringing a carbon and by a carbon we know that the Hilacha is part of the mitzvah, it's not just a Heksher mitzvah it's not just a preparation for the mitzvah, but part of the mitzvah itself is being moilich the carbon, hilachas a carbon. So therefore, bris mila is very is compared to a carbon. So the hilacha itself is part of the mitzvah. Um, that's what he answers.